Hello, 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 my friends. My name is Jill Osborne. I am the president and founder of the Interstitial Cystitis Network. It is Sunday, April 11th, and it is time for another IC support group meeting. I am just setting up my streams here. Whoops. Hold on. My purpose in doing these meetings is to make you so strong, so knowledgeable, so informed that no one can mess with you again. My goal is to empower you, to educate you, to inspire you, to encourage you, to uh, give you hope. Worst thing that anybody can do is tell you that there's no hope when it comes to IC. There's tremendous hope. All righty. So now I'm just trying to fix my stream. So we are broadcasting live on Facebook and YouTube right now. And I'm just trying, I have a different camera set up. Some things, I seem very, I don't know why you're looking down at me. That's so weird. Hold on. All right, hold on. I'm trying to figure things out. Okay. Hello, Michelle. Nice to see you. All right. Facebook, you're looking at me closer. <laughs> Hello, Roxanne. Have I heard of radioactive iodine treatment uh, for IC? The answer is no, I have not. Hello, Cindy. It's nice to see you. I hope that you're doing well. All right. So, 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 so. It's a glorious spring. I'm so glad now that things are brightening up. We've got some sun to look at. Okay, hold on a sec. Discord has detected. No, I don't. I'm not doing Discord right now. Hold on. Let's quit that. All right. I am so happy that we are now in the spring season. I'm wearing one of my happy spring shirts. <laughs> Hello, love. She says, I have AC and it controls my life. Is it, is this, is it this way, way with anybody? Well, it is at first until you figure it out. You know, a big part of IC is really understanding what variation of IC you have. Not everybody's the same. For some people, IC begins in childhood, while for others, IC begins after menopause. So you are, as I say, an anatomical mystery to be solved. We have to figure out what in your body is triggering your symptoms. Uh, it can be muscle. It can be, uh, it can be a genuine problem with your bladder. It can be with a tarlov cyst coming off your spinal cord. It could be... Um, uh, a, a, fibro a fibroid tumor pushing on your bladder. <sighs> you know, I see is very, very unique. And I think the mistake that we have made for so many years is assuming that everybody is the same. And we're not, you know, guys, we're absolutely not the same. As Sherry says, has anybody went, gone out on short-term disability because I see? Yeah, girl, I did. I did. Absolutely. I needed that year. Um, I went out for a full year on um, uh, my IC was so severe, I could barely sit in the car and drive to work. And I know that whenever I was hitting a speed bump, I would cry or in my car and I would walk into work, you know, just really feeling like I was damaged goods and not getting any support. You know, I mean, you know, you think that we women are going to be really good at supporting each other. And you know what? We actually kind of suck at supporting each other sometimes. And eventually I got laid off because uh, of my IC and, and uh, I sued for five years, finally got a settlement, um, but it is what it is. Um, so, but the good news, hon, is that I'm living proof that you can get better and lots of people do get better. And so you need to carry hope in your heart. People do. The challenge is we don't want to, we don't want you to waste five years doing therapies that are not going to help you. I mean, if your fundamental problem is pelvic floor driven and you're doing bladder therapies, you're approaching this correct, incorrectly. Whereas if your problem is primarily pelvic floor and your muscles are so tight, you can barely pee. There's no reason for you to be spending a lot of money doing bladder therapies when you need to be putting your money on to pelvic floor muscle work, right? Um, so let me introduce myself here for a moment. So again, Jill Osborne, president and founder of the Interstitial Cystitis Network. Uh, I bring to you uh, the longest serving IC support group leader in the country, if not in the world now, and that is 28 years as of this year. Uh, this is my job. This is what I do every day. I work with patients every day on the phone through the IC network. Uh, we are rated number one in the world by Harvard Medical School and the University of London. And I'm really thrilled to share that I was actually published by Harvard in a new book called Facing Pelvic Pain. And that was very, very exciting. Uh, that was earlier this year. 
Um, I bring you to you three college degrees. I have a degree in chemistry. I have a degree in pharmacology, drug development. I have a master's degree in psychology. And the IC network was my doctoral dissertation proposal and how to bring support to people who were, who were homebound. Because I was homebound, you know, literally overnight, everything changes. Literally overnight, everything changed. And I went from being a triathlete, swimming massively, doing my massive workouts. I would do 100 flights of stairs a day. I would swim a couple miles. I would row five or six miles. Those were my workouts. Literally overnight, bam, they all stopped. And the assumption was back then that it was primarily a bladder problem. But now we know that for many of us, myself included, it really is a muscle problem. And I think in hindsight, I absolutely had a muscle problem. Hello, Leanne. Hi, Debbie. Rosie says, I have a prolapse now. Bladder has fallen bad. Yeah, girl, you're going to have to work on that. As long as you, if your bladder is falling, it's not in a good position. And we've got to improve that. Now, you guys know that for those of you who've been here before, I care for a 98-year-old and a 92-year-old. And one of them is calling me right now. Give me a minute. Okay, I'll be right back. Hold on. All right, all is well. All is well in the Osborne house. <laughs> um, I sat on the U.S. Army IC research panel for almost 10 years. Uh, so I kind of bring this really weird skill set because I have a lot of science, I have a lot of pre med. Uh, I did not go to medical school, even though that was an option for me. I did surgery for a year with my pharmacology dissertation, but I chose not to go to medical school because I just honestly, I didn't have confidence in my math skills, even though I passed calculus. I just, I've had a lot of doctors <laughs> yell at me and say, Jill, you should have gone to med school. But in, in me doing that, I, I also want to say to you that I'm not a medical care provider. It is not my job to give you medical advice. It is my job to open doors and educate you and kick you in the butt and get you back to your doctor's office so that you can ask better questions and take control of your medical care. Because seriously, who's the boss? You're the boss. You're the boss. You're the boss. You pay them. They don't pay you. You're the one who should be making the decisions about your medical care. But the way that works is if you bring in a skill set and knowledge so you know what the hell you're talking about. If you walk into the doctor's office and you say, I don't care what you do, just give me anything, make it go away, that's a huge mistake because you have to know what your options are. You have to know what structures are in your pelvis who could be involved. I don't ever want you to say, it hurts down there. Please don't say it hurts down there. That's a mistake. Absolutely a mistake. You gotta say where. Is the pain inside of your body? Is it outside of your body? And in other words, is it external or internal? Is your pain high or low? Is it shallow or deep? Like, do you feel it up by your vagina or is it down by your skin? Is it by your urethra? What makes the pain better? What makes the pain worse? Are you diet sensitive? Some of you are, some of you aren't. Remember, some of you are diagnosed with IC when you were a kid. Others are diagnosed with IC after menopause. Some of you are diagnosed with IC after you fell and broke your tailbone. Others of you have been diagnosed with IC because you went through chemotherapy. You are not the same. There is diversity in this patient population. There's diversity. Not everybody in this room right now has the same set of IC. They don't. Now, if you see me move, looking around, it's because I'm simulcasting on two different internets on two different cameras. So if I'm looking here, I'm looking at Facebook. Hi, Facebook. If I'm looking here, I'm looking at YouTube. And we're just trying to figure out what's going to work the best, <laughs> what's going to work the best, because it's been challenging this year. All right. So normally when I do these meetings, uh, they're going to last two to three to four hours. Sometimes I've gone even five hours. Um, I always start with a little educational lecture or almost always. Then we're going to take your Q&A. Then we're going to go on to Zoom uh, and we'll do some Zoom if anybody wants to do that. And then we'll come back and close it out on Facebook and YouTube again. 
All right. So today I have a reveal. Woohoo! <laughs> What's hold on? Here is our latest magazine, the IC Optimist. How cool is this? And because men get icy too, we're highlighting male stories in this one. So I've got two really good stories from the Pelvic Health and Rehab Center for men, a young man, an old man, oh, an older man, an old man, an older man who is cured with pelvic floor physical therapy. Okay. We can talk about cure now. We don't think of IC as an incurable bladder disease anymore. We don't. We think of it as a pelvic pain syndrome. Why? because structures outside of the bladder are also involved. And so in this issue of the IC Optimist, I've, it's again, spotlight on men, but I also feature an interview with Dr. Elise Day. Dr. Elise Day is the um, editor of, where, where did it go? Here it is. Facing Pelvic Pain. Now, this is our latest book that's come out, and this is an absolutely fantastic book, because if you don't know what the hell is wrong with you, but you go to the doctor and the doctor says your bladder looks normal and you're laying there screaming, going, oh, my God, I must be dying. It must be cancer. What the hell is wrong with my bladder? And guess what? Your bladder looks good. Your bladder looks very, very good. Why does that happen? This book will tell you why this happens, because this book outlines all the other things that could potentially trigger the symptoms we associate with IC. All of them, bowel, bladder, um, reproductive tract, bones, nerves, muscles, inherited conditions, rheumatological conditions. And so if you just don't understand what the hell is wrong with you, this is the book to get. And here's the deal. It's free. It's free on Kindle Unlimited. No excuses. It's free. You have nothing to lose. It's free. You need to, again, if you're confused about what could be triggering. You know, it's so it's so interesting when I work with patients because so many of you, you really don't. And here, I'm going to try to move this a little bit more. Guys, I'm just playing with my layout here. Hold on. I know I'm moving my head around. Hold on. Facebook, is that better than I, okay. Is that better Facebook? Nope, but look, you can see the camera on YouTube. <laughs> oh God, who said I'm a, who said? Okay, is that okay? Ah, oh, what the hell? Uh, Julie says, can you get the book from our website? No, we don't sell it. We, we don't sell it, it's on Amazon. Um, we just haven't been able to set up that arrangement yet, but it, it's free on Kindle Unlimited. There you go. Okay. So anyway, in our latest magazine, The Ice Optimist, we feature an interview with one of the editors of this book, Dr. Elise Day. And what's so important about this, <laughs> Facebook, I'm sorry. Hold on. I think you guys were looking at my door. <laughs> Oh, wait. Okay, wait a second. Hold on. Okay, there you go. I'm so, I'm sorry, Facebook. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> wait, now I dropped this. Oh, come on. You know laughter. Hey, come on now. Laughter modulates pain. So if you're in pain, I'm hoping you're laughing a little bit at my goofiness because hopefully that will make you feel better. So... <laughs> The reason why I did this interview is you have to understand that the, the next generation of doctors are retiring. Okay, so when we talk about Rob Evans, Rob Moldwin, you know, Christine Whitmore, uh, Ken Peters, they are all probably going to be retiring in the next five, five or 10 years. So who is the next, the next generation of IC, you know, IC experts? It's going to be Dr. Elise Day, Harvard Urology. And she's fabulous. And what's so cool about this is, and again, if you're a member of the IC Network, you can get this right now on your member page, is you can see how much has changed. So much has changed, my friends. So let's see here. 
She talks about estrogen atrophy. She talks about men who have pain in their penis and at the tip of their penis. And why does that pain happen? She talks about um, what can a man do who is struggling with doctors who say, yeah, I've got chronic prostatitis and isn't looking beyond that. Um, she's talking about uh, related conditions. Like uh, any of you having wicked TMJ right now? Oh my God, I am. <sighs> my left side, I wake up, I've been sleeping in my recliner for the last week because my left side is all messed up. Uh, and that's even with a new guard. What else does she talk about? Uh, she talks about punental neuralgia. She talks about anxiety management. Do you think IC is an autoimmune disease? How many of you have been told that your IC is an autoimmune disease? Well, she answers that. She says, this is an age old debate. Does it have to do with a lack of connection among the cells of the lining of the bladder, exposing the nerves underneath? Or is it more of an allergy prone condition? Or is it based on the pain fibers of the nerves? I definitely think small fiber polyneuropathy is part of the picture and many people with IC and, and autoimmune disease is associated with small fiber polyneuropathy. We are starting to learn more about these conditions and their relationships. You know, I mean, this is such a good time right now if you're, if you're struggling with IC because, you know, they have, they have such better knowledge about the many things that could be contributing to it. And here's the one thing we know, at least now for sure, is back in the 50s and 60s, many men and women were told that this was all in their head. And it's not all in your head, not even close to being all in your head. It's real. One of the other things that we talk about in this book, in this magazine, is small fiber polyneuropathy. So you're going to hear that more and more and more in your IC discussions. So small fiber polyneuropathy means that the nerves in your skin, it's like a, these are the tiniest diameter nerves in the human body. It means the nerves in your skin have developed a neuropathy. They're, so these nerves are, are, their sole purpose is to transmit heat and cold as well as pain. But for some of us, these nerves get injured or damaged or you inherit a more injured nervous system or a more sensitive nervous system. So when we look at that classic symptom of extremely sensitive skin, being having a wicked sense of smell, um, having um, a drug sensitivity, chemical sensitivity, food sensitivity, even visual sensitivity, where if there's a funky pattern in a carpet or a wallpaper, it drives you absolutely crazy. We know what that is now. That is something called small fiber polyneuropathy. So what causes that? It's so interesting. What causes that, number one, is for some of you, it could be as simple as a viral infection. If you've had shingles, if you've had herpes, so something called post-herpetic neuralgia, where the nerves after the herpes infection had become more sensitive. Um, it could be a chemical injury. If you have been exposed to a traumatic chemical, that's why chemotherapy can cause chemocystitis, IC cystitis like symptoms because some of the medications used in chemotherapy can damage nerves. It could be from an industrial exposure, mercury, a heavy metal. It could be, and it's more commonly caused by a vitamin B12 deficiency. So, and, and that's the crazy thing. That's the absolute crazy thing is that a lot of us are B12. All right. So you guys on Facebook, um, you're, okay. Now you're not on Comcast. You're on at and YouTube is on Comcast. Facebook is on at and so for those of you who are, oh, you know what? Hold on a sec. Unless it's picking up the wireless. Ooh, it might be. Uh, hmm. Okay. All right. Sorry, you are hardwired in. Weird. All right. All right. All right. So, so how many of you have been told you have a B12 deficiency or a D3 deficiency? Well, if you're low in B12, guess what happened? 
guess what happens? Your nerves become more reactive. And I know that when I start feeling more pinprickling in my skin, I go and take B12. And I've got, um, it's methyl B12. It's considered the best B12. But the other thing that's just really kind of sad is that some of the medications that we've all been given because we've had quote unquote lower urinary tract symptoms, they also cause small fiber polyneuropathy. So what's exciting about this is that, is that number one, nobody can say that this is all in your head. Number two, it's provable. It's provable with a very simple skin test, a biopsy done by your ankle. They can do that to determine if you have small fiber polyneuropathy. Now this is groundbreaking for us because this is objective evidence. It's proof. We've never had proof before. Now we have proof. Now we have proof. The other thing that's so important about this is it helps us understand our treatment priority. So if you have chronic overlapping conditions, if you got IC, IBS, vulvodynia, et cetera, et cetera, um, super, super sensitive skin, then your therapeutic priority is going to be calming nerves down. Because guess what? The bladder has small fiber small fibers in it too. So um, anyway, we introduced this. We introduced this in this magazine. And I think it's really, really important. Jay on YouTube says, getting B12 injections and taking 50,000 units of D3 once a week. I think that that's very, very, very smart. Hello, Donna. Nice to see you, hon. Been a while. Uh, Marlene says, hi, Jill. Do you find quercetin helping with allergies? My IC is very affected by it this time of the year. Well, actually... Our other big story in this is seasonal allergies in IC, because guess what? Your, your bladder has mast cells during allergy season. It's really common, very, 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 very common to flare as a result of allergies. And so doing using medications and have an antihistaminic effect have been long used for the bladder wall. And of course, we are absolutely going to be using more when we have allergies, right? We're going to be using a, quite a few more when we have allergies. Uh, and if you have asthma, then what we want to do is we want to do something called Monte Lucas. Monte Lucas has also been found to be very, very helpful. And that is according to Dr. Robert Evans, who taught an IC class at the American Neurology Association a couple of years ago. Um, there's a couple of other things in here that I think are really important. Um, uh, remember smoke, anything in the air can trigger it. So whether it's pollens from allergies or smoke from fires, just understand that those have the potential of triggering a reaction in your body, in your lungs, and potentially in your bladder. It's important potentially during allergy season to have an air uh, a uh, HEPA air freshener in your, or air filter in your bedroom so that you're not sleeping with that. If you're going to be outside, wear a pollen mask. Uh, leave your shoes outside. Don't walk them inside during allergy season because you're going to be bringing allergens in. Um, let's see, what else do we have in here? We go over prescriptions, over-the-counter meds. So the question was, would quercetin help? Potentially, but probably not as well as a typical antihistamine like hydroxyzine. Quercetin is commonly found in most of the IC supplements, most of the urinary supplements, no doubt about that. Uh, it has a mild antihistaminic effect. But if you're really, really struggling with allergies, the odds are your doctor's probably going to be prescribing uh, an antihistamine uh, instead or recommending something a bit stronger than that. But it certainly wouldn't hurt. The thing with quercetin, and that's in Bladder Builder and Sister Protec and Sister Renew and Bladder Rest and all of the supplements have quercetin in it. You have to look at the source. A lot of quercetin comes from citrus. Sit, they're called citrus bioflavonoids, and citrus does not work for us. So we do better with quercetin derived from plants like the Sephora plant. So if you're taking quercetin separately, make sure you look at the source of the quercetin and don't use a citrus-based bioflavonoids. Uh, Donna says, Jill, I think IC has been a drop box for the unexplained. So true. That's so true. All right. Oops. Oh, hold on. Oh, there you go. Hey, guys, got my COVID shot. Got my first COVID. Pfizer, no problems. Didn't even feel it. Did not even feel the needle. 
had no issues afterwards, wasn't even tired afterwards. Of course, that was the first shot. We'll see how the second shot goes in three weeks. All right, so let me come back over here to Facebook. So Rosie says she's got a prolapse. So let's just talk about that for a moment. A, a bladder prolapse means that your pelvic floor muscles, which normally hold your organs in place, are starting to collapse. And, and thus your bladder starts to fall through uh, or your bladder can flop over. And there are times if you catch it early enough that something that a physical therapist can give you exercises that will strengthen those muscles and prevent further progression of the prolapse. But if the prolapse has become so severe because your muscles are really wiped out, let's just say you had a couple of children and those muscles got really stretched out and or you're older in estrogen atrophy, you, there is going to come a point where you're going to require intervention. And the intervention is usually going to be either a pessary, which is something that they can stick up into your vagina that will kind of hold things in place. Kind of looks like a donut. That's one shape. There are lots of different types of pessaries. And it might surprise you to learn that a lot of elite athletes, by the time they're in their 20s, are using pessaries already. Distance runners. You know, their workouts, especially those Olympic super, super, you know, superior athletes, their workouts have been so extreme that they've done a lot of muscle damage. And so it's not unusual for elite athletes to be using pessaries as for women. But there might come a point where even the pessary doesn't start working and you've got to go instead to perhaps a surgical repair. And that's where the mesh surgery got so, so complicated because meshes really mess people up badly. Meshes caused a lot of tissue erosion, a lot of infections. And I was at the first research, uh, first conference where they actually brought the research back of an explanted mesh and it was covered with bacteria. And so we're not using meshes to repair so much rather than your own natural tissue. The challenge with doing that is let's see, how do I, how do, how do I want to say that? Um, we have, you, ha we all have mus a certain level of muscle tone. So it's just, let's just say it's kind of relaxed. There's your pelvic floor. It's not super tight. It's just kind of relaxed, good, healthy muscle tone. Right. And then of course you end up with a prolapse and things start to fall. So the surgeon uses their fingers to create the correct muscle tone when they're tacking it up. And sometimes you end up tight. You end up with really, really tight muscles, so much so that they hurt and they might have to go in and surg surgically release them. So, you know, a prolapse repair is fairly tricky and you definitely want to talk with your doctor about their experience level, what they're choosing to do, how they're choosing to approach this, et cetera, et cetera. Just don't wait too long. Guys, don't wait too long. If you have a genuine abnormality with muscles, understand that bladder therapies are never going to fix that. What's going to fix that is muscle work. Carla says she missed last Sunday, had an awful flare. Oh, honey, I'm so sorry. Yeah, it was Easter and I just needed to hang hang with the folks. Lori says, how can I make an appointment with you? Lori, uh, yeah, all you need to do is, is call. Our 800 number is at the top of our Facebook page, at the top of our website. Um, or you can sign up for wellness coaching in our store. Uh, Don says, what do you think about the O shot? My OBGYN suggested it to support my sling and for IC relief. I have no sexual issues. The O shot. Um, I'm not familiar with that term. I think, I think I've heard that one other time. Hold on. Let me see if I can find it. O shot. Things change so dramatically. Oh, that's the plasma, the platelet rich plasma. Um, so platelet rich plasma has been studied with IC now for probably about three to four years. The research studies are pretty good. Uh, basically what they do is they, uh, um, give you an injection of blood plasma that is, um, believed to improve oxygenation. It will improve blood flow, cell growth. It contains growth factors, so it will enhance that cell growth a little bit more. It's kind of like the old stem cell therapy for IC that was based on, what was that based on? Um, 
uh, stromal vascular faction, SVF, where basically in the stem cell version of this, what they would do is they would do liposuction. They would take some of your fat, they would process it, extract the um, growth factors and all the good stuff, and then they would put it back into your tissue. And the research with that showed a limited effectiveness that it lasted about six months and then a patient had to have that done again. So the O shot, they say this done in the vaginal walls, the clitoris or the clitoral hood. I, honey, I've never worked with anybody who's ever had that done, Don. I just don't know what to tell you. But platelet-rich plasma, we've covered in our magazine. We've covered it on our website. It's certainly an option. The challenge is finding doctors who are willing to go that far and do some new experimental things. Rosie said, that said your muscle tone is good. Well, Rosie, if your muscle tone was good, then how could you possibly have a prolapse? Because prolapses happen because of poor muscle tone. Sherry says, I just did eight weeks of bladder installations, but I think more is needed. Well, Sherry, remember, it's all about your subtype. Is it your bladder wall? Is it your pelvic floor? Is it something else? Uh, what bladder instill did you do? Anissa here on Facebook is saying she had a sling done surgically. Shell says, it's frustrating when you're working, people can see that you're hurting. They just say, why don't you stay at home? I know some of you are saying it out of concern, but staying home is just not a possibility for me, not to mention I feel the same whether I'm working at home or working. Yeah, I hear you, hon. That's how I felt when I was working. Rosie says, I hate bladder crap. I love the new one. <laughs> Hi, Carolyn. Nice to see you. Um, we're doing okay. Hello, Helen from Iowa. Robin says she's been living with it for 10 years. The leakage is getting me now. Ooh. Lauren says, I'm so worried about Elmeron, but can't imagine life without it. Lauren, hun, we have a lot of new therapies. We have a lot of other therapies that do the same thing that Elmeron does, provide a coating effect. And, you know, understand that that the reason why they created Elmeron in the first place was they there were a lot of women who did not want to have catheterization, men and women. And so Norm, before Elmeron was invented, the way they treated the bladder really was through a catheter, put medicine in your bladder, et cetera, et cetera, like DMSO. But, you know, basically a lot of people didn't want to do that. And so it was Dr. Low Parsons who created Elmeron, a oral medication that you could swallow by mouth that would coat your bladder. Of course, the flaw with this is if you swallowed a Band-Aid, would you really expect it to come out the other end of Band-Aid? And the answer is no, we have digestion. And the company's own research study showed that like 92 to 94 percent of Elmeron was rendered inactive or destroyed by digestion. Destroyed. So only a little bit of Elmeron actually ever arrived in your bladder when you took it by mouth. And the reason why I think we, we're seeing so many of these eye cases now is because the bioavailability of Elmeron was so poor that you had to take a lot of it to get a meaningful amount in your bladder. So think about it, you know, only five to six percent arrives in your bladder. The rest of it gets, you know, gets destroyed by your body or sent out through digestion. Well, now we know that those excess levels apparently also change the retina. And that's why we have patients who now have uh, retinal damage from Elmeron use. And so, Lauren, you know, what we want to look at instead, if you really love the Elmeron, the safe way to do Elmeron is in the form of an installation. Rather than swallowing it by mouth where it goes into your bloodstream and it's delivered throughout your entire body, you can put Elmeron directly in your bladder. It's called an Elmeron installation and they will often combine it with lidocaine or marcaine. There's much less risk of it getting in any significant amounts throughout the rest of your body. But if you don't want to do that, and a lot of people don't want to do that, a lot of people have left Elmeron, to be quite honest, then you're going to be looking at, you could do a chondroitin-based supplement uh, and or a chondroitin-based bladder installation. And last year, or two years, no, it was last year, uh, uh, a year ago, last February, uh, I think, was the European Society for the Study of IC published a first paper that proved that the most important ingredient is chondroitin. Why? Because chondroitin was the most effective at restoring the superficial integrity of the bladder cells. 
the top cells of the bladder wall. And so if you come on over to our website, icnetwork.org, I have a whole page on transitioning from Elmeron and what your options are. Okay, so don't be don't be afraid. Remember, Elmeron's old anyway. We've learned a lot about IC since then. And remember, a lot of you don't really have a bladder wall driven case of IC that your case might be might be exacerbated because you have tight muscles or you have fibroid tumors or you're not walking correctly and you're putting strain on your pelvic floor. You know, you just we got a lot more answers now. Alyssa says, uh, Anissa says, I love my urologist. I have pudendal neuralgia and high tone muscle. There you go, girl. So that's what you got to work on. Annie says, thank you so much for the book. I did send out 10 copies of the book, Facing Pelvic Pain. Uh, I had about 100 people ask for them. Yeah, we did that two weeks ago. And I had one person email me and ask why she didn't get one. And I just said, we, we had a lot of people asking for it. And we picked the people who just gave us the, the best flare management tips where they really took some, made an effort with their email and asking for it. But I will have many more giveaways. Never worry about that. Rosie says, I went to the doctor and about bladder pressure pain. It was, then he felt my bladder will like be better once I have my operation. Uh, well, your bladder should feel much better once they repair the prolapse. I'd be stunned if it didn't. Sherry says, mine is diet and stress induced. Anissa wants the magazine. You guys, you can do the magazine. You can get it over on our website, icnetwork.org. Anissa says, how do you get the book? Um, hi, David. Thank you, Sherry. Uh, the book is on Amazon. Uh, uh, there you go. Uh, Rhonda says, I've been burning lately. No fun. You said if lesions are on the bladder, they should have been treated while under anesthesia. Did the doctors know this in 2000? Yes, they did know this in 2000, uh, because this is the first time I heard this from you recently. I have bleeding lesions. My doctor said it's not as bad as he thought compared to some of that are the worst. Wow. She said when she had her son, he was 10 pounds in 1982, and the birth broke an artery, and you hemorrhaged through your stitches. Whole, you were in a coma. Wow, the girl. Oh my God. Wow. You know, I remember um, a high school teacher said, said in class, what was his name? I've forgotten his name. I, it will come to me. Um, he said, the greatest gift that a woman can give to a man is to risk her life to bear his child. And Rhonda is living proof of that risk because she hemorrhaged, she, they ruptured an artery and she hemorrhaged her childbirth. I don't know what kind of, I can't imagine that that would be triggering your hunter's lesions, hun. I, I can't imagine how that would happen. Uh, but you certainly had mega trauma. I would assume that you've got some pretty significant muscle stuff going on and maybe even some nerve stuff going on, depending upon what happened there. What, what's going on with your pelvic floor? Debbie says, does anybody use natural estrogen and can you recommend it? Uh, I use estrogen. I wouldn't go without it, to be quite honest. Uh, Shell says, my urethra is so inflamed, it hurts to wipe. I'm trying to ice, but that's not so awesome. So Shell, um, I have a great blog over on our website called The Seven Causes of Urethral Pain. Um, let's go over those really quickly. Uh, if I can remember them all, <laughs> um, the very first thing we're going to consider with the urethra is dryness. So the urethra is kind of like the canary in the coal mine when it comes to estrogen atrophy. And so um, understand that your vulva is wet, your vagina is wet because mu they're mucous membrane organs. But guess what? So it's your urethra and so is your bladder and so is your mouth. And the purpose of that mucus is to act as a barrier and to protect you. Unfortunately, that mucus is estrogen dependent. So when you're young and you have lots of estrogen, your, black, your urethra can defend itself. But when you're older, you have much less estrogen, thus that skin cannot defend itself as well. And so that we call it urine burn. If you feel burning while you're urinating or on your skin afterwards, the very, very first thing we're going to be looking at is the quality and health of your skin. That happened to me when I was 51 or 52. 
And it felt like there was a drop of urine stuck in my urethra that would not come out. And, you know, guys, like my self-help skills are really good. And, and I, you know, I mean, I've written the IC network. I know my stuff. And so when the symptom started for me, I threw the book at it. It's like, what the fuck? What is wrong with my urethra? I was like, what the hell is going on? And for three months, I threw everything I knew at it. I could not make it go away my urethra was so irritated. And again, it felt like there was a drop of urine stuck in my urethra that would not come out. So um, I threw myself on the mercy of my urologist and went to his office and said, please, can you please help me with, and figure out what's wrong with my urethra? So he puts me on the table. I'm in the stirrups. He takes a look and he goes, Jill. <laughs> and I'm like, and I'm laying on my back going, I'm looking at him going, what, what, what I do, what I do. And he goes, didn't you use the estrogen cream I prescribed for you last year? And I went, no, no. He goes, why? And I went, because in my, in my head, I'm 25 years old and I can't imagine having an age related disorder. <laughs> That's the God's honest truth. And he goes, yeah, I wouldn't have prescribed it for you if I didn't see a problem already. And they gave me more estrogen cream. And within two weeks, the, the urethra irritation was gone. Okay, Shell. So we got to look at the quality and health of your skin. That's number one. Number two, we've got to look at your muscles because you've got levator ana muscles right around your urethra. And those if those muscles are tight, that's going to make your urethra very irritated and inflamed. We want to look at chemical irritation, soaps, laundry detergents, especially if you're older and your skin can't defend itself. Um, we want to look potentially for an infection of the periurethral gland, which is halfway up the urethra. So, Shell, come on over to our website, icnetwork.org, and just Google urethral pain on our website, and you'll find the article, and it will go through all those causes. Jay was Jay says was on Elmeron for 40 years. Looking back, it really didn't help and was a big moneymaker. Yeah, it was. I've told the story of a late of an older woman who put her entire life savings into paying for Elmeron. She had nothing left. And she called me because she didn't know what to do. And I said, I said, well, did the Elmeron ever help you? And she goes, no. And I said, why did you keep taking it? I mean, she took it unnecessarily for 20 years. It never helped her. And of course, now we know why she probably had a muscle problem or something else instead. And she said, because that's all they had. That's all they would give me. Elise says the last ultrasound when my bladder shows that my bladder wall is much thicker than it should be. What do you think could be the cause? Uh, inflammation, irritation, um, infection, scarring, uh, all of those can cause a thickening of the bladder wall. Yeah, look for infection, really. And allergies are bad, which is why I'm scratching my nose. I apologize. Rebecca says, I got IC after being on Depo Provera. Studies show connection from birth control to IC. That is very, very true. We had our first case study released last year of an 18-year-old who suddenly developed symptoms, very healthy girl. Over a period of a year, her symptoms got worse and worse and worse and worse. She had many different diagnoses. She was told she had IC. She was told she had recurrent UTI. She was told that she had candida infections. Nobody helped her. And finally, the fifth or the sixth doctor that she saw said, hey, you didn't happen to start some birth control, did you? And yes, she had. Two weeks before the onset of her symptoms, she had started oral birth control pills. They took her off the birth control pills and her symptoms went away. It took a little bit of time, two months, but her symptoms did go away. Remember that, that your bladder needs estrogen to produce mucus. And when you are in artificial menopause from Lupron or even birth control, which isn't quite se as severe, you're limiting the ability of your bladder to produce that nice protective coating. And so understand that estrogen can play a role here. Birth control can play a role. Rachel says, I've been on Depo Provera most of my life and now I'm thinking about it. That's when my pain started. Sherry says she is chronically low B12. Me too. 
Uh, is it too late? Has damage been done? No, no. You know, your body's wired to repair itself. Healing is always happening. Our goal is to figure out what is impeding healing. Your job is to create an environment that will support healing and tissue repair. Shell says, before I started my B12 shots, I had numbness in my fingertips. Wow. Okay, now here's Anne on Facebook who says that her B12 levels are high. Interesting. Betty, thank you so much, Betty. Betty says, we're so blessed to have you. Thank you. Thank you, hon. That's very, very sweet. Shell says, my doctor wouldn't do the biopsy for small fiber polyneuropathy. He said it wouldn't change your treatment. He put you on gabapentin. Well, I mean, that's logical. Uh, what was the book name? The book name is Facing Pelvic Pain. Mylene says, hi, I'm from Canada. I had a hydrodistension almost 10 years ago. My bladder was bleeding. My symptoms may disappear a few days before my period, and then it comes back in force. Is there anybody like me? Why do hormones impact the bladder? So I've already, I've just explained that. Lauren says, would gabapentin work better than amitriptyline? Lauren, they work in, in different ways. Uh, the uh, amitriptyline is a low-dose antidepressant. The gabapentin is an anti-epileptic. Apples and oranges, you can't really compare them. JP says, are there any men who have icy problems? JP, dude, <laughs> you better believe there, there are men who have your problem. Absolutely, 100%. And that's kind of my, you know, when I think about my personal specialties, one of my specialties is working with men because my first support group was filled with men. I mean, this was back in the early 1990s. I had a ton of men in my group. And so, yeah, uh, the challenge with men is y'all are very quiet. You know, you don't talk a lot about it publicly. But behind the scenes, there are millions of you who have it. I'm not lying. I was working, I work with men every, um, every week. And last week, I'm going to say I worked with like three or four men in a day, which was awesome. Really love to help guys. Patty says, I'm almost three months after my hysterectomy and doing well outside of lingering pelvic floor tightness. And my second COVID shot whipping my butt. The rest of 2021 better be nicer. It will be, hun. You're over the worst, girl. You're over the worst. But don't, but don't go too far. Remember, you can't lift anything, Patty. You can't lift anything for at least six months. Do not make the mistake and go back to the old things. You've got to follow those, those instructions about not traumatizing your pelvic floor. It's been three months. So the good news is your stitches are finally healed, right? This, the, they're three-month stitches. But you have a lot more healing to go before you're going to be able to lift anything heavy. So you've got to be careful with that and follow the doctor's instructions. Annie, thank you so much for the stars. Valerie, thank you so much for the stars. Kelsey says, can we talk prolapse? So prolapse occurs again when your pelvic floor muscles are not holding things in their proper position. Let me grab my handy dandy. My favorite, my favorite, my favorite, my favorite demo. All right, so let's just take a look at these pelvic floor muscles. So y'all understand, whoa, oh gosh, wait a second. <laughs> so you understand what we're dealing with here. So here's your hips, here's your pelvic cavity. And you will notice that underneath your pelvic cavity, there are no bones to protect you. These are your sit bones. These are the bones that you feel in your tush when you're sitting down. And a lot of us have tender tenderness right around these. So, and so if we, and if we look on the inside, there you go, you can see that your pelvic floor muscles basically follow along the bones. They're flat along the bones. And they're, they're low and high. Some of them are very low and some of them wrap up and around, um, up and around um, your pelvic cavity. But this is the most important thing for you to look at because when you ride a bicycle, you're pushing straight up into muscle and straight up into nerve. So imagine what would happen if you're pushing up constantly. 
That's why people get um, bike rider syndrome, pudendal neuralgia. But if these muscles have been weakened because you've had a baby and you put, or you're straining, like that's why they tell you, please don't strain when you're having a bowel movement. Please don't strain when you're trying to pee because you're actually stretching these muscles out a little bit more. And so what happens is that these muscles start to droop. And so if we look at what comes inside of the pelvic cavity, we're gonna put a vagina, right? And we're gonna put our bladder. So there's our bladder, there's where our bladder goes. So you can see, you can see that that's why you have pain if it's your bladder, right, 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 right above your pubic bone. And we've got bowel. We can put the bowel in there. Not that we need to, but you can see it's a pretty crowded, complex space of your body. And if these muscles, if this muscle starts to collapse, things start to fall through. So if you ever feel like you have a hard lump in your vagina when you're trying to go to the bathroom and it comes and goes. Sometimes you feel it and sometimes you don't feel it. And it's hard when you feel it, but you go to the doctor and the doctor goes, I don't see anything. And then you go back home and it's like, it's right there. And you lay on your back and you go to the doctor. The doctor goes, I don't see it. Well, that's because you're laying on your back and your muscles have fallen backwards rather than downwards. So um, uh, with a prolapse, again, you want to try to catch it early. Uh, I have a very mild prolapse myself on it's uh, it's nothing severe um, and I do specific exercises for it and I need to remember to do them. Uh, Lori says, uh, platelet rich plasma helped my plantar fasciitis. Good to know. So you guys, if you're wondering why I'm looking all around, it's because I'm on multiple computers and multiple cameras. So uh, Anne says, a frequency urgency flare. Why? Anne, thank you. Thank you, because you have now brought up my little mini thing I was going to do today. So in our latest magazine, we feature a, a blog called Gotta Go Right Now, Urinary Urgency Explained. So um, the first thing you've got to understand about the bladder is that it basically only has two primary nerve groups. Nerve group number one is your alpha afferent nerves. And this controls frequency urgency. These are the nerves that your body uses every day to tell you when to pee. And then you've got nerves called the C fiber. And the C fiber nerves are the nerves that convey pain. The alpha afferent nerves are very easy to turn on and they're kind of hard to turn off. So if you've got a fundamental problem with your bladder, whether it's an infection or you drink too much coffee, your first symptom is gonna be frequency urgency because that's a nerve that gets turned on easiest. And then it normally takes something big, something major to turn on the C fiber. But when that C fiber gets turned on, you get, you get some more significant pain. So what causes frequency urgency? And so we have a great article in this called Got to Go Right Now. And this is written by Melinda Fontaine of the Pelvic Health and Rehab Center. Let's just go over the five potential causes of urgency. Um, let's see. You know that feeling when you just drank a, the equivalent to a big gulp and you haven't had a, a bathroom break in over four hours? That sensation of your body telling you to get to the bathroom ASAP is called urgency. And in case you wonder if urgency and the frequent need to urinate are common problems, look at the number of apps available for finding the nearest restroom. Um, but what if you felt that same sensation when you have not had any a lot to drink and you've just emptied your bladder. You may feel fine one moment and then suddenly have an urgent need to go the next. This is a red flag that something is out of sync in your body. Urinary urgency and frequency is a very common symptom that our patients here report here at the Pelvic Health and Rehabilitation Center. Let's go over some of the causes and solutions so of this very common and treatable problem. The Pelvic Health and Rehabilitation Center, they have offices in the San Francisco Bay Area, in Los Angeles, and then back east also in Connecticut. So cause number one of frequency urgency is bladder irritation, bladder irritants. 
So we're thinking coffees, teas, sodas, things like that. Uh, tomatoes, vinegar, artificial sweeteners. You, you got the grip. You know that. The second thing we're going to look at is being dehydrated. Because if you're dehydrated, your urine's getting more concentrated and more irritation. Uh, and more irritating. So we want to make sure that you've got good hydration. And this is where something like, you know, bladder builder, bladder rest, allopath, something like that might be helpful because it will help to coat the bladder wall and protect it from the irritants that you might be eating. Um, the second thing we're going to look at are tight tissues. She says, typically when the bladder fills up and gets heavy, it weighs down the structures around it. The stretch receptors in the muscle get activated and send a message on a nerve to the brain telling you to find a bathroom. If the muscles and fascia around the bladder are already tight or restricted, then the stretch receptors can activate the messaging system to tell you to go even if the bladder is not full. Um, in some situations, especially when dysfunction has been present for a long time, the body may have made more nerve endings and more sensitive nerve endings around the bladder. When they each send a message to the brain, the brain gets a lot of signals, yada, yada, yada. Okay. So basically increased sensitivity of the nerves. Right. Okay. And their goal within that situation is to retrain the nerve system. Okay. Possible cause number three, retention. Retention. You're just not emptying your bladder. Why do you not empty your bladder? Again, we're going to look at tight muscles. That's usually the dominant problem. If you've got urine sitting in your bladder for a very long period of time, the odds are you're going to have uh, more infections and more superficial irritation of the bladder wall. The next thing we're going to look at is constipation. Are you constipated? Because if you're constipated, you basically have a lot of stool pushing against your bladder and irritating your bladder that way. So that can cause some urgency. Uh, estrogen atrophy, like we talked about earl uh, earlier, and that she says here, there's something called the urge drill. And I thought this was important. I wanted to mention this in our meeting today. Um, in the same way that fire drills teach us how to do what to do in case of fire, it is handy to know the urge drill. When you feel a super strong urge to go, uh, our tendency is to rush to the nearest bathroom. When the urge is strong, your body is employing the fight or flight system that makes your bladder contract to push urine out. I guess if your body thinks that you're going to be running away from a mountain lion, it might be useful to have an empty bladder. Um, running to the toilet reinforces this behavior and makes the bladder continue to squeeze. On the contrary, slowing down to breathe and calmly walking to the toilet makes the bladder less likely to squeeze and can decrease the urgency you feel and the likelihood of not making it to the restroom in time. Do some quick pelvic floor contractions or relaxations or both can send a message to the bladder to stop the squeezing as well. Also, distracting yourself can decrease the urge because your brain will prioritize something else over having to run to the restroom. Some ideas for distractions include curling and uncurling your toes, naming every green vegetable that you can, singing a song in your head, waiting until the urgency has somewhat or completely subsided before peeing can teach the nervous system not to overreact to slight pressure in the bladder. Over time, this will lead to less urgency. So what is the urge drill? Number one, stop and breathe. Number two, do a couple of pelvic floor contractions and relaxations. Number three, distract yourself. And number four, slowly, calmly, and slowly and calmly walk to the bathroom. What's the solution? Pelvic floor physical therapy. How do we train, retrain the nervous system? Is it like training a puppy? Pelvic physical therapists have many techniques, such as the urge drill, to adjust the way you think about using the restroom. This teaches the brain how to have an appropriate response. For example, when you use the urge drill successfully, you wait to urinate until the urge is decreased. And this reinforces to the brain that it does not need to create so much urgency the next time. Uh, pelvic floor physical therapists can also use myofascial release on tight tissues around the pelvis. Manual therapy creates length and flexibility in the tissues. They are less likely to create a false sense of urgency. Okay. So, you know, we're talking a lot these days about fight or flight. We're talking a lot these days about, um, 
uh, how important it is to um, recognize heightened long-term periods of stress and anxiety. That when you are under heightened intense stress, and frankly, who the hell isn't right now? I mean, I think we all are at this point in time. You're triggering your fight or flight. And when you trigger fight and flight over and over and over again, your body is preparing to fight or flee. Your body is thinking your life is at stake. And so your brain takes over and your brain does all sorts of other things that can affect your bladder. You know, uh, so um, I, I've talked about this in depth and I, I, I don't have a good intro to talk about this right now. Um, I, maybe I will in a bit if I get the right opportunity. But just understand what what is she saying here is that for many of us, our muscles are tight and our nervous system is amped up because we are under heightened levels of stress. When you have a stress related flare, we know what's happening. When you're under stress, you tighten muscles subconsciously. You can't turn that off. When you're under stress, your nervous system becomes irritated and inflamed. You cannot you cannot directly turn that off. A lot of that is subconscious. So we've got to retrain our nervous system, retrain our muscles to respond correctly and normally. One of the things I say, let me describe a typical IC flare because I think this will make sense. You go to bed at 11 and of course you peed before you go into bed and you wake up at 12 or 1. You feel like you need to pee. You go to the bathroom, you pee out, yeah, maybe a quarter cup of urine. You go back to bed. You wake up 30 minutes later. Your bladder feels really, really full. You go to the bathroom. You pee out maybe a teaspoon. You go back to bed. You wake up 15 minutes later. If, you, if, you, if you've been lucky enough to fall asleep, your bladder feels very, 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 very full. It hurts. You get up. You go to the bathroom. And you might get a drop. You might get a drop. And that is if you strain. And, of course, if you strain, you're just reinforcing everything and making it that much worse. Right? That false sense of fullness, feeling like you're full, even when you're empty, is a sign of a bladder screaming for help. It is saying it has been traumatized. It has been saying it is extremely irritated. And the nerves are jacked up and the muscles are jacked up. And so what we've got to do is calm things down. If this flare began because you ate the wrong foods, because you've got Hunter's lesions or IC subtype 2 bladder well driven, you got to do the diet protocol. You got to do the reduced acid protocol. But if you're flaring because you're under stress or you're flaring because you sat in a car for a long period of time or you're flaring because you had sex, that's not a bladder wall flare. That's a pelvic floor flare. You have to do the pelvic floor relaxation protocol. And you have to go, if you go over to our website, and you sign up for our free newsletter, you'll get our 40 page flare management guide. And it goes, it has hour by hour rescue plans on how to rescue you out of a bladder wall flare and a pelvic floor flare. All right. Rhonda, so here, hold on. So Rhonda has Rhonda has a a really difficult situation. She says that she started going back and forth to the bathroom since the third week of March. She has terrible TMJ. Her anxiety is wicked high, but she's also high in B12. But she also had a bladder lift and she's hoping that her new frequency urgency isn't the result of the bladder lift. Um, she said it felt tight afterwards, especially on the left side. I'm confused and worried now. When I asked my doctor if it was a sling, he said no, which I, which I did. I, I don't know if that's a typo or not. Your Euro OBGYN did the lift. You also had a bad experience with physical therapy. It's taking me a while to go back to my doctor. 
you have a new physical therapist. It's just hard for me. I know I will at least go. You know, Rhonda, you are a post-surgical patient, girl. You're you're a post-surgical patient. So you had a bladder lift. You had one of the hardest surgeries you could have. You don't say how long ago you had it. You're if it's within the last year, you're still in your recovery period. And remember that when they when the physician is doing the surgery and they're trying to find that magic right muscle tone for you, um, it's it's a experience matters. Um, some doctors will accidentally, and, and this is not anatomically correct, but this is the best way I can show it to you. So let's just say that this is the shape of your normal pelvic floor muscles. But let's just say that on one side, the doctor pulled it a little tight. That's real. That happens. And so the question is, is it so tight that it's giving you it's giving you new symptoms? Or is there a chance that with physical therapy, it will relax and release? And that's the right question for your physical therapist, hon. You got to ask the physical therapist. I mean, again, if you look at this model here, you can see, and, and when they do physical therapy, it is a finger up your vagina or up your rectum, okay? And you can see how deep these muscles go. I mean, look at that. This my whole finger goes all the way and I'm, I'm still not reaching the top of these muscles but you will notice that these muscles are fairly flat. They go along the bone, right? If one of them is tight, it starts to lift up off of the bone. And so I, I think at a minimum, Rhonda, getting yourself back to physical therapy, having somebody touch those muscles independently, <clears throat> trying to understand the overall tone of those muscles is going to be very, very important for you. Um, I, I'm thinking of one patient that I worked with who, who's literally the doctor, the muscles were so tight, they were like hard boards, <coughs> and they had to go in surgically and release them. And that's what fixed it for her. So I don't know, you know, I'm guessing you're guessing you need facts. Now you need to go back and let's and make sure when you go to that physical therapist, please don't walk in and say you have IC. You need to walk in and say, listen, I had a bladder lift. I had a prolapse and I'm having some funky symptoms. And especially on this side, on this left side. And I'm here because I want you to help me understand what is going on on the left side. Hello, Tanya from Belgium. I'm now in my third week of fungal treatment. Urinating is already working better. I also have started uh, caprylic acid, Q10, garlic. <coughs> um, so she says, which doctor should I go to? So so guys, for those of you who are new, you might not know that it was our own National Institutes of Health who five, six, seven years ago discovered that many patients who were flaring were flaring because they had an overgrowth of candida fungus in their urine, in your urine. And of course, the problem here, you, you feel like you have infection. You feel like you have the, you're having the world's worst infection, right? agony. And you go to the doctor, they do a urine culture, they call you back and go, there's nothing. Well, here's the problem. A urine culture doesn't test for fungi. A urine culture does not test for candida. It doesn't. It does not do that. So um, that's where something called next generation DNA urine testing is really, really important. If you flare after you eat sugar, if you flare after you eat carbos, that that strongly suggests that you could have a candida problem. And that is something that Tanya eventually figured out with the help of a doctor and a test. And she already says she's urinating, urinating better. Tiffany says, could a head cold call cause urgency frequency? 
Well, if you're coughing a lot, you're stressing your pelvic floor. And when you're stressing your pelvic floor, you could be triggering some frequency urgency. So I would, I would give that a yeah. Georgia says, thank you for the book. You're very, very welcome, Georgia. I'm really glad you got it. Georgia says, can estrogen cream be, bring blood clots? Um, uh, I think it's possible if you are having blood clots after using estrogen cream, that is an immediate call to your doctor. You need to let them know that's happening immediately. Lauren says, why does birth control help with flares if it, if it is taking estrogen away? When I started the E-string, because of flare, my flares were much better around ovulation. I have always believed that when we think about our subtypes, our five core subtypes of IC, which are hunter's lesions, bladder wall driven, pelvic floor driven, pudendal neuralgia, and central sensitization, I have always believed that there was a hormone subtype and that the hormone subtype falls within the bladder wall variant. Um, and here's the issue. Patients are opposite. Some people flare when their estrogen levels are high. Other people flare when their estrogen levels are low. And I don't understand biologically what's happening there, to be quite honest. Um, and this has not gotten a lot of interest among the key researchers, although we do have the new case study, which is important. So, hun, Lauren, just understand that everybody's different. You are an anatomical mystery to be solved. You are a hormonal mystery to be solved. Uh, keep track of how you're feeling. Keep track of when your symptoms are better versus worse com com compared to your period. And then you're just going to have to talk with your OBGYN and try to come up with some different options there. Leslie says, has anybody ever had to have their bladder removed because of end stage IC? Yeah, it's rare, Leslie. It's very, very rare. But over on our website in our support forum, which has more than 50,000 members, um, uh, there is a board for bladder removal. Bladder removal is only, is only considered if your bladder has shrunken to a very, very small size. I mean, like normally your bladder would be like this, but if your bladder is like this and it can only hold a little tiny bit of urine, that's when they're really going to start looking at perhaps removing your bladder or if you've suffered a traumatic injury. I've told the story of a, a, another dear friend of mine, a dear friend, uh, an IC patient who symptoms started when she was a teenager and her symptoms were very severe and the doctors just blew her off and she was extremely emotional, extremely upset and people were looking at the emotions and not her bladder they finally went in in her early 20s and surgically looked at her bladder and guess what it had been it was ruptured and her bladder had been ruptured for ever since the car accident years and years and years earlier like literally urine was leaking into her belly 24 hours a day it was a catastrophic bladder injury that they missed and then they blamed on her so when they saw when they finally saw the extent of the bladder damage they removed her bladder it could not be repaired. So it does happen. Uh, we have a support forum on over on our website. Uh, you can read lots of posts from other people who have had exactly the same questions you've had, Leslie. Okay, you're not alone, girl. Shell says, thank you for addressing all of our questions and comments. Some days I feel like I don't have anything to say and days like today where everything you're talking about, I'm relating to. Georgia says, what to do mainly for urethral pain, not pelvic floor dysfunction? Well, you can be having urethral pain because of pelvic floor dysfunction, my dear Georgia. So again, let's look at our model here. So these are, with this model, we're looking at the middle level and the deeper muscles. We have to put, whoops, oh, darn it. We have to put on the shallow muscles. So let's put on the shallowest muscles here, also known as your levator ani muscles. And these, you know, it's held on with magnets and the magnets, okay. So look, here are your levator ani muscles. And the first thing I want you to 
look at, it's like, here are your sit bones, stay. So here, here are the bones in your butt you feel. And you can see that your levator ani muscles attach from your sacrum to your sit bones all the way to your tailbone, right? Now, what makes these muscles very, very unique is that they're the only muscle group in the human body who also control important biological functions, peeing, pooping, and having sex. How did they do that? Well, they have holes. So we have a rectum, we have a vagina, and we have a urethra. And you can see that if these muscles are tight, it's going to be hard to pee, it's going to be hard to have a bowel movement, and it's going to be painful to have sex. Letting stuff out is going to hurt. Pushing something inside is going to hurt. You see that? So kind of this perception that this is all bladder driven is just really a terrible mistake. It's musculoskeletal driven as well. So here's your urethra right here. And bam, if these muscles are tight, it's going to be hard to pee. Now, the other thing I, I want to talk about is the perineum. So, right. So here's the perineum. The perineum is between your vagina and your rectum. It's about an inch long. And for men, it's between the base of their testicles or their scrotum and their rectum, right? This is the hot point. This can hurt. This little piece of skin can hurt like hell. When my vulvodynia was bad when I was uh, in high school and college, it felt like somebody had rubbed sandpaper and stripped off all the skin. This is raw rough sensation. And yet you'd go to the doctor and the doctor would go, hey, it looks fine. And I'm like, it can't look fine. I cannot wear underwear right now. It hurts so bad. So it was, it was this book, which finally explained that breaking through chronic pelvic pain. This is a book for people with musculoskeletal issues. And he explained that immediately above the perineum is something called the perineal body. And the perineal body is an attachment point for four muscles. And so if you have pain right there, it's because you have muscles that are pulling on this, they're pulling on each other. And there's some great diagrams in here. Okay, this is a this is kind of a better picture. And again, I'm on two cameras here, but you can see there's a little, there's a little kind of knob right there that's underneath the skin, that is the perineal body. And so if you have pain on the perineum, it's muscular. <laughs> you know, and I just kind of go back in hindsight and think about all the, because I had frequency in seventh and eighth grade. I had urethral stricture at the same time. Then I had vulvodynia. Then I had ovarian cysts, yada, yada, yada. And in hindsight, at least for me, I really believe that the great majority of my symptoms are muscle driven, muscle and nerve driven as compared to bladder driven. And look for tailbone injuries. Go back in time and think about when your symptoms began. Had you fallen on your butt? Had you fallen on your tailbone? Emma on YouTube says, have there been any cases of correctional surgeries for bilateral kidney reflux causing IC? No, not that I'm aware of. I would assume again that you're looking at some muscle and or nerve trauma when you're having a surgery like that. Emma says, has anybody else had IC since before they were 10? Yeah, a bunch of people. And um, uh, we look at genetics, we look at central sensitization, but even more importantly, we look at trauma. We look at trauma, accidents, 
falling, something falling on your tailbone? Were you abused? Uh, were you riding a bicycle? Were you a young gymnast, a, a young dancer? Did you have any bad falls? In the um, at the um, 2020 International Pelvic Pain Society meeting, um, the whole meeting was dedicated to chronic overlapping pain conditions. And why do patients end up with bladder pain and vulvar pain and rectal pain and fibromyalgia and TMJ and all that sort of stuff and, and have wicked sensitive skin. And of course that's me. Um, and the most important class was a pediatric risk factor class, Emma. And so what they found in their research is that for, when you look at a child who's developed these symptoms in the year prior to the onset of symptoms, that child was a 80% of the children who developed this had a physical trauma, getting hit by a car, falling badly on your tailbone, and that it was a ripple effect from this initial physical trauma to the pelvic cavity. But 20% of them were the victim of bullying or uh, abuse. And the example that I use is a, um, a new puppy. So let's just say you have an, uh, some, you, your family brought in a new puppy and that puppy comes in happy, 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 tail wagging, tail wagging, just the happiest little thing you've ever seen. And when you turn your back, somebody kicks it and you hear the, you hear the yelp and the, and the puppy is like going, what, 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 what happened? But the puppy, the puppy comes back and is like, okay, you know, comes over, happy, 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 tail starts wagging again. And then when you turn your back, it gets kicked again. And it starts getting kicked every day. Well, you can damn well bet a week from now, that's not the same puppy. That is a puppy who, instead of coming into the room, happy, 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 tail wagging, is coming into the room, tail between their legs, scared. If you're calling that puppy, come on, come on, puppy, come on. And the puppy's coming in and his tail's down and he's like looking like this. Man, that puppy thinks it's going to get hurt again because somebody is hurting them. And what that does neurologically is that puppy is now living in fight or flight. That puppy is being hurt. It's being hurt. And so it is now fighting for its life. The brain thinks it is fighting for its life. And it is fighting for its life because animal abuse is out there. But so is, so is childhood abuse. But guess what? This happens to adults too. Let's say you get a new job and you got a bully at work. Say it's your boss. I had, I had, I had one terrible boss. Oh my God. I would just love to find him one day. I'm just very calmly eviscerate him. He was so mean. You know, there are some people who are just so cruel and this guy was cruel. And so what happens is you're fine at home, but you drive to work. And then as soon as you open that door, you go into fight or flight. You're waiting for the next time if you're going to get hurt. And that changes the way your brain functions. What happens is your sympathetic nervous system takes over. You are living in heightened states of stress. You are, um, uh, your muscles are tight, your blood pressure is raised, your heart rate is raised. And what they said at the International Pelvic Pain Society is that it takes 20 days of stress like that to change your nervous system for the worst. But it takes 20 days of mindfulness and good work to repair that damage and get your brain functioning normally again. So I hope that that kind of helped. Um, it all came up because we started having a lot of uh, brain studies for IC patients and patients with chronic overlapping pain conditions. And that's been going on for about a decade. I mean, a long, long time. And I really didn't talk about them a lot because number one, I didn't understand them well enough, but number two, I thought they were kind of scary. And I, and I just, you know, it wasn't something I was really comfortable talking about until I attended this really in-depth class. And what it showed, really what the brain studies show for some of us, not all of us, but for some of us, is that our brains are functioning in extended fight or flight. 
that normally your day-to-day -day brain activity is controlled by the parasympathetic nervous system. And the sympathetic nervous system only takes over when you're under stress. And its sole purpose is to save your life and to protect you. So if you are almost hit by a car, if you're startled, if you open the front door and there's a saber tooth tiger, your sympathetic nervous system takes over, bam, whoops. <laughs> your sympathetic nervous system takes over. Jill's life is at stake. Oh my God. Raise her blood pressure, raise her heart rate, tighten her muscles. We got to get her prepared to run from the saber tooth tiger. When the stressor is gone, the parasympathetic nervous system takes over. And what does it do? It lowers blood pressure. It lowers heart rates. It relaxes muscle. But what our brain studies are showing for patients with chronic overlapping pain conditions and central sensitization is that's not happening, that we're stuck in extended fight or flight. And it's hard to live with that tremendously high level of anxiety um, and constantly being on edge and constantly, you know, having... <sighs> It's like you're guarding yourself physically, mentally, and emotionally. I, 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 it's kind of hard to explain, but we know how to fix that. We can fix that. We know how to fix that. We fix that by turning the sympathetic nervous system off and turning on the parasympathetic nervous system. So let me put it in context this way. When you look at a brain scan, it's like a thunderstorm in your brain. I mean, this area lights up and this area lights up and this area lights up and this area lights up. I mean, the brain is just this great, still remarkably unknown organ and how it works. But you're, as, as you are going about your daily life, your brain is um, paying attention to your senses. It's paying attention. It's just paying attention to what's happening. Are you sitting on a hard chair? Is it hot? Is it cold? What do you hear? What do you smell? Do you smell a fire? Do you hear somebody screaming? Do you hear an animal crying? Your brain uses your senses, hot, cold, where are you touching, to respond to whatever you're going through. But your brain also uses your memories. Gee, has Jill ever felt this before this buzzing feeling on the left side yeah she has that happens when she sits on a on, on a car too i mean on a on a chair too long right or no she's never had this before oh my god this is kind of scary what the hell is this right so your brain is monitoring your senses but at the same time it's going over your entire history for context like have have you ever been exposed to this before is there any context for this at all? So, and that's why you're seeing lots of different parts of the brain light up is it's just, it's just processing everything. The way we turn off the sympathetic nervous system is by using our senses. We have to get it to pay attention to other healthy inputs. And so our last magazine, the IC Optimist, was dedicated to this. Um, we've covered it in depth. I've covered it in depth in previous online meetings, too. Um, these methods have been tested ex successfully by Harvard, among others. Um, and uh, so we can do I spy or we can do tapping. Those are two of the most effective ways of doing that. So let's do I spy. Let's just do an I spy really quickly. So our purpose in doing I spy is to uh, engage our senses, turn off the stress and turn on good, healthy brain functioning, right? So how do we do it? So um, the first thing I want you to do, so let's just do it, is pick something in your room that you like. Just pick it, pick something and look at it. Just is it flowers out the window? Is it a bird at the hummingbird feeder? Is it your task board, which is what I'm looking at? Just take a moment and just look at it. It's purple, it's green, it's yellow, it's orange. I'll show it to you. 
right? All right. Okay, so keep looking at it. Now let's take a nice, slow, deep breath in, out. Okay. What can you hear? Can you hear anything in the background beside my voice? Can you hear anything? So I can hear my parents talking at the kitchen table. So just focus on that for a moment. Just let your hearing control your sensation right now. Okay, in, out. What can you taste? That's another sense. Can you taste anything right now? Just dive into it for a moment. For me, hello, minty. Yum. In, out. Okay, I want you to pick something near you that has a texture. And I want you to touch it. Just rub your hand over it. And just like, because your brain is going, what the hell is she touching? Is this okay? Yeah, this is okay. Yeah, it's furniture. It's fine. But just kind of let your brain, you know, my brain right now is like going, okay, that's interesting. What on earth is she doing? But there's no threat here. It's just a texture. In, out. Okay. And can you smell anything right now? What do you smell? Can you smell anything interesting? This is why aromatherapy helps, right? Because aromatherapy helps your brain pay attention to something else. Mm. And just kind of like dive into that. In, out. Okay. Now, just do a, a quick check-in. How are you feeling? Hmm, not, not quite as stressed, right? Because your senses are balancing. But now let's go to the fun part of it. The fun part of it is, okay, if you could look at anything and it would bring a smile to your face and joy to your heart, what would it be? If you could look at anything, what would it be? And visualize that for a couple seconds. And for me, that would be a cat wrapping around my legs, which happened yesterday at my sister's house. It was great. Okay, now in, out. What could you taste that would bring a smile to your face? What would it be? Piece of cake for me, cinnamon roll. Hot cinnamon roll or hot apple pie. In, out. What could you smell that would bring a smile to your face? What would it be? Lavender, roses, in, out. What could you touch that would bring a smile to your face? And for me, that's petting a cat or a dog. In, out. So th this method, I mean, guys, this, obviously I'm running through it very quickly. That's called I Spy, and it's proven in research today. They, they use it with uh, veterans with PTSD, and it's stunningly successful at calming the brain down and re-engaging that parasympathetic nervous system and getting you out of fight or flight. Now, you can't kid a kidder here. I know some of you are dealing with massive anxiety, massive anxiety. You can't kid a kidder because, girl, I've been there. Um, if anxiety is dominating your life, if you have catastrophic thinking, if literally every other thought is negative, I'll never get better. I'll never find a doctor. I will never do this. I will never do that. Girl, your anxiety is out of control, which means your sympathetic nervous system is engaged. We have got to calm that down. It's hard to have normal bladder function if you are living with constant fight or flight. And so come on over to our website if you can. 
and get our latest, our last magazine from uh, New Year's and read about that. We've got to get that anxiety under control. Every time you have anxious thought, you're just creating the self-fulfilling circle of anxiety. So your ability to manage anxiety is a part of this process and learning new skills to do that is essential. You know, this is the, you know, you're, there's no shame in being, having anxiety. A lot of us had anxiety for very, very good reasons, but we can't let it control our daily lives. And the challenge here is that when you are anxious and you are in pain, your brain thinks your life is at stake and it will intensify that pain. But if you are in pain, but you're laughing, your brain goes, but she's laughing. It must not be that bad. And your brain will minimize that pain. So we've got to work on anxiety got to build some better anxiety management skills. Take my word for it. I took one anxiety class 20 years ago, and I have not had a single panic attack since then. One simple class. And I have a video on our website, Anxiety and IC, and I would encourage you to watch it if you're struggling because you're not alone. No shame, no blame. But God didn't give you the skills to, to deal with anxiety when you were born. You got to go learn them. And that's where taking a class is really helpful. Claire says, for amitriptyline to work as an antidepressant, it needs to be 1,500 milligrams. It is not a low-dose antidepressant. It needs to be a high dose to work. Um, Claire, actually, some doctors would disagree with you um, and say that for some of us, the lower doses are actually as effective, if not more effective. Mary says, my symptoms started two weeks after stopping a proton pump inhibitor following uh, Renoir for a high dose repair of a hiatal hernia. What treatments might work best? Well, if you got a hernia, hun, you've got some muscle stuff going on. I would really want to know what's going on with your pelvic floor muscles. But that would be a very good question for your doctor. I'm, I am not an expert in that in any way. Anne says, does frequency urgency mean that you have IC? No, it doesn't. It, that's actually, it would, you would fit into an overactive bladder diagnosis or frequency urgency syndrome, or just basically drinking too much, you know, coffee, caffeine. Why do people drink coffee in the morning? It makes you pee and it makes you poop. Is that a disease called IC? No, it just means you've taken something which has stimulated those nerves, which is giving you frequency urgency. Debbie says, I was told to take hydroxyzine, but I'm not sure if I want to take it. I do take macrobit at night as a preventative. Um, um, so Debbie, the macrobit at night is under significant debate uh, right now. You uh, Long-term antibiotics are not recommended uh, for the treatment of IC by the American Urology Association, whereas hydroxyzine is recommended. I myself took hydroxyzine for many years. I found it to be remarkably helpful in a very low dose. Um, and that made more sense given the fact that I flared when I had allergies too. Billy, thank you for your stars. I appreciate it very, very much. Laura Lynn says, I have fibromyalgia, peripheral vertigo, costochondritis. I would, Laura, um, if you can get our current magazine, those are actually symptoms of small fiber neuropathy. Also the vertigo, especially. Tiffany says, I feel like you're the only professional that understands IC, and I really thank you, Tiffany. Uh, and again, is frequency urgency a sign of IC? Not necessarily. It can be a sign of a lot of different things, pelvic floor, fibroid tumors, endometriosis. Kelsey says, can we talk about how much the bowels play into pelvic floor? I have IBS and feel like my bowels push and pull on my pelvic organs a lot. Well, you know, that's a challenge here, hon, is that, again, this is a very small confined category. So in addition to, I mean, a, a small confined container, in addition to your vagina and your uterus and your bladder and your muscles and your nerves, we do have bowel going right through there. You can see the hole that it would go through. That's the hole that it would go through. And, um, and that would help you understand why constipation would trigger the bladder. Because if we put the bladder 
where it belongs, which is okay. Get over there. So here we've got the bladder on top and then we've got the, and actually this would be on the left side. There we go. I don't have my attachment here. I have to have my, my levators in place for these to stay in position. Um, anyway, yeah. If you have hard stool at, that's pushing on nerves, you're going to feel it. If you've got hard stool or you've got what we call packing, where you've got a lot of stool in your, or just above your rectum and it's not coming out, it's not fun. Amanda says, my physical therapy worked on, physical therapist worked on some muscles around my belly button. It made my symptoms better. Good to hear, hon. That's good. But you're getting another cysto with a hydro distension and rimso tomorrow. You made it five months without one. Well, and you fell off your diet. Well, girl, there you go. So Amanda, see if your, see if your doctor will take pictures for you so you can see what your bladder looks like. That'd be nice. Normally, guys, whenever you have a hydro distension, ask them to take pictures so that you they can give you and put in your medical record so that you can visualize what they see. Because if you have a completely normal bladder wall, then that would tell us that your burning and spasms might not be from the smooth muscle of your bladder, but from the skeletal muscle of your pelvic floor. Amanda says, yes, that's what my doctor told me. My body's always under protective mode. Yeah, you're in fight or flight. Rhonda says, those of us who have fight or flight, often it affects those of us with IC than those without IC. Well, if you're under extended fight or flight, that's just going to create a, a systemic reaction throughout your entire body. And that's the entire point here is, is that if we think, I mean, that's what the research for chronic overlapping pain conditions and for IC shows, not for everybody, but for a small subset of patients that, yes, we are living under fight or flight. And that is controlling quite a few of our symptoms. Soledad says, my bladder is inflamed. I have rigid bladder walls. My bladder got worse after a hydro distension. What could be other options? Well, um, you know, uh, Soledad, this is where I think what Claire is offering here is really important. I would absolutely have a next generation urine test. Uh, let's see if they've missed a, a chronic infection. The, the question is what type of infection? It could be bacterial but it could also be fungal or viral. And I think that um, that's just due diligence. It's due diligence to do a, a more exact, exacting, specific diagnostic urine test to rule out all the other things which could cause persistent bladder wall inflammation. And it happens. There are pa some patients, not everybody, you know, if you, if you all know me, you know, I don't believe in broad strokes, but are, are there a subset of patients who have chronic in embedded infection? Yeah, I think there are. I think that there can be chronic fungal infection, chronic bacterial infection, and chronic viral infection. And in fact, our own National Institutes of Health, again, released their first viral study last year, right about a year ago, which again proved that 10%, I think it was eight or 10% of the patients in their study had active live polyoma virus in their urine. And the polyoma virus is linked to hemorrhagic cystitis in research studies. So if you've got a bleeding ulcer on your bladder, there's strong evidence that that actually could be a viral infection. And that is also what we think is happening in that subset of IC patients who get COVID. So we're doing the only IC COVID study on the IC network. And I haven't even looked at the data in the last couple of weeks, but I've got over 100 patients in that study so far. 75% of them report that their symptoms got worse with COVID. 75%. 25% of in that group report extremely severe symptoms. It brought patients out of remission who had been out of, in remission for a decade or 20 years. Bam, their symptoms come back. Um, where typical 
flare management strat strategies don't work and they stop working. And this patient ends up in a flare for a, a severe flare for a couple of months before things calm down. And we think that, and I've talked with a number of doctors about this, we think that these patients probably have an active COVID infection in the tissue of their bladder. Why do I say that? Because we have 14 research studies who have found live virus in urine, and we have four studies which have found live active COVID infection in the kidneys. So if it can happen in the kidneys, it can happen in the bladder wall. And we already have lots of research that proves that viral infections in the bladder wall happen, especially if you're immune compromised. So if you've gotten COVID and you've had a, a flare, you're not alone. You're not making it up. It's absolutely real. 75% of the patients in our study report flares. And some of you, unfortunately, really, really wicked flares. But they do, as the viral infection calms, you know, eventually gets defeated, the flare tends to go away. George, uh, George says, I'm going through so much urgency right now. It's been very discouraging. My symptoms started in January, burning in the bladder and urgency. I still don't know if it's IC. Well, you've got to do your due diligence, hon. We got to look, number one, at what happened in January. Did anything interesting happen in January? Did you fall? Were there any accidents? Did you have a baby? Were you under prolonged stress? Did you get COVID? And then you've got to do a proper diagnostic workup. That means we have to look at your history. They've got to do the correct lab testing and they've got to check your muscles. Burning, burning is actually a muscle symptom rather than a bladder wall symptom. Anne says, does overactive bladder cause flare? Sure, sure. If you trigger those nerves, you're going to be peeing, and peeing a lot. You're going to have a lot of frequency urgency. Flair says, I see is a blanket term given to a bunch of symptoms when the urologist or doctor hasn't gotten a clue. That's true. I see is a grab bag diagnosis. It doesn't, it doesn't really mean a lot. That's why we go for a more specific diagnosis so we understand your unique anatomy and presentation of symptoms. Anissa says, do you think medical marijuana will help us? Yes, medical marijuana helps many patients. We did our we did a long, long study with that, it's been published for years. If it works for you, go for it. The, the consensus in that study was that patients do better with edibles rather than smoked because you don't get the byproducts of the burning or the vaping in, in your in your bladder. Edibles appear to be better. There you go. Um, and of course, we always say you want testing to make sure you're getting a high quality ma medical marijuana that's not contaminated with fungicides and pesticides. All right. FG says, what do I think about pelvic floor Botox injections? Are they safe? Um, uh, uh, if you've got uh, trigger points, um, then they can do a, a trigger point injection where they would typically numb. They would numb that area the, of the trigger point and then use their fingers to try to massage it out. Um, uh, Botox in the pelvic floor you can understand why it would work because they're assuming that you've got a dysfunctional nerve that's keeping that muscle tight. So if we turn the nerve off, the muscle should relax. Um, but there are always challenges with Botox and that is where do they inject it and what other structures can it impact? Um, that's why Botox is a step four treatment option because it is known for causing urinary retention when used in the bladder wall. Julie says, tried having sex for the first time in six years. Penis could hardly enter so tight, felt like the bones were blocking entry. Tore the perineum. All right, girl. So two things. You got tight muscles. And number two, you've got dryness and estrogen atrophy. That's That would explain the tear in all likelihood. So don't give up. Don't give up. You need to go back to a physical therapist, have a proper pelvic floor assessment. Let's see what the hell's going on down there. And also, in, also look at the quality and health of your skin. And if you've got estrogen atrophy, this is about moisture. Half a tube of KY per sex act. You, dry skin on dry skin hurts. We don't want to do that. You got to be moist and you got to have relaxed muscle. Okay, so you guys, it is time to start the Zoom portion of our meeting. And so let me 
Uh, so in the Zoom portion of our meeting, what we do is uh, you can come into Zoom and you can ask your questions directly of me and I uh, get a little bit of coaching. If y'all want to do it, that's fine with me. If you don't, that's also fine with me. I am open to whatever you're open to. So to get into our live support group, Zoom meeting and Facebook and YouTube is still going to be open. Uh, you go over to our website, icnetwork.org and click on support and go to the streamed support group meeting. I have just started the Zoom meeting and oh my God, I look terrible. Oh. All righty. So let me, so that meeting is up and let me give the invite to YouTube here because the Zoom is going to be on, is on my YouTube internet. All right, YouTube, there you go. There's your invite. All right, Facebook. Hold on a thackeroni. All right, I'm just copying this link for you on Facebook. All right. Rhonda says, can you have more than one subtype? Absolutely. Debbie says, what meds do you recommend? Um, uh, we recommend the bladder smart low acid multivitamin. And um, uh, not, not bladder ease because it uses citrus bioflavonoids. We would be bladder builder, bladder rest, sister protect or sister renew. Flair says, if someone gets COVID and they get a flare, there isn't much they can do about it. You're right. I completely agree. Oh, honey, I'm so sorry. Flair says that she lost her boyfriend 19 days ago and his sister. I'm so, so sorry. So I'm so, so sorry that, that COVID has touched your family and your boyfriend like that. Hi, Debbie. All right. So the YouTube. So you guys, y'all have the invitation. If you want to come on over on YouTube, that's great. Come on over. I will let you in one at a time. If not, that's fine. If you need the link again, please let me know. It is time for a quick bio break. You got to pee. Go for it. I got to pee too. All righty then. I wanted to hold up on. Um, where is it?
One sec. All right, all righty then. Um, there is considerable debate about the use of antibiotics to treat IC, as we know. Um, and um, I will say in my interview with um, Dr. Elise Day at Harvard, uh, which is arguably the number one medical school in the world, I asked her if she ever treats IC with um, long-term antibiotics, and her answer was never. So, uh, and she is the chair of the International Continent Society uh, Education Committee. Uh, so she's quite up there. So there is considerable debate and discussion about the use of antibiotics and um, it is what it is. All right, so, um, so again, we're starting the Zoom portion of the meeting. If you wanna come in and talk to me directly, please feel free. If not, that's okay too. All right. Hello, Debbie. How are you? Hi, how is life treating you today? Whoops, hold on. She says they can't, can't hear me. I saw her briefly. Okay, Debbie, you need to unmute yourself. And if you can start your video so I can see you, that'd be great. There you go. Now, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, well, how are you doing, my dear? You look beautiful today. Well, <laughs> not so beautiful, but how are you? I am. I am enjoying a beautiful spring day. Despite the allergies, it's nice to kind of walk away from the cold of winter. Well, that's true, but the allergies are bad. They are quite <laughs> bad. The nasal drip, yeah. the nasal drip is real. <laughs> Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So how are you feeling? Um frustrated. I'm 68. Um I've had this IC for years. Okay. Uh I I have a and everybody tells me to do take a different thing, do a different thing. Um when I was first diagnosed, I kept thinking I was having UTIs. Right. And then the doctor who he passed away, he was wonderful. Um, he told me to, you know, no, which I don't do. No, the icy diet. Okay. You know, no, no acid, no aesthetic stuff. Okay. And I have followed it perfectly and I, I've been pretty good. Um, but I think because of COVID sitting in a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so how, so let me ask you some questions. Sure. How old are you now? 68 years old. Okay. And how old were you when you symptoms started? Don't I know. Like <laughs> I know, girl. I believe me, I know. Don't worry, don't worry about it. Um, I would say it probably started in in the early to down middle, like oh boy. So in your forties, you think it started in your forties or your fifties? Probably fifties. Okay. Okay. And, and prior to that, did you have any history of bladder infections, anything at all like that? Not that I remember. Okay. Not that I remember. Okay. That's good. Um, are you, um, so I do notice that you have red hair. Are you a, are you a true redhead like I am? No, I wish I was. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's important. So understand now when we're working with patients, um, the first job is to study your body because we can't okay. have a good discussion of therapy until we understand your unique presentation. So I okay. want you to go back in time to when your symptoms began. 
Was there any okay. event that you associated with the onset of your symptoms? Um, probably work at the time. Okay. Why? What was going on at work? Uh, I worked for an ophthalmologist. I was a technician and a lot of stress, a lot and, of stress. And sitting, all the time. sitting for a long period of time, you, moving your neck uh, back and forth for a long period of time. Um, I didn't sit a lot. I, I ran around the office a lot, but okay. I did sit. I did sit, but it was a very stressful job. And I mean, I loved it, but, and I kept getting UTIs and, um, or I thought were UTIs until okay. I went to this urologist who diagnosed me with IC. Okay. And so the only way that the bladder can tell you that there's a problem is through the symptoms of frequency urgency. Everything right. feels like infection. You could have a bullet wound in your bladder and it would feel like infection. It all feels like infection. Right. So let me back let me back up in 19 when I was 35 okay. I had a total I had a total hysterectomy with uh -huh. a Marshall Marchetti a bladder lift. Oh Is that what they call okay. It? Okay. Why did they do that? Because I'm a DES daughter oh. or what my mom took DES. Okay. And According to the urologist who did the bladder lift, he said he lifted me too high. Okay. As a favor, because my brother was a doctor, I didn't get that. And I had, they could not get rid of, I had blood in my urine for months. I switched urologists and he did a cystoscopy. I don't know what else he did, but then I felt better. Okay. Um, so it was, I would say it was at least nine months after the surgery that my urine was never normal. Was it a, a total hysterectomy? They took your ovaries too, correct? Yes. And yes. was it vaginal or did you, do you have an incision on your belly? I have an, like a bikini incision. You have a bikini yes. incision. Okay. So we know that structures were cut. We know that muscles were cut. So you had right. a major trauma but they said you had a prolapse. They discovered that before the hysterectomy? Yes. Have you had you had children? Yes. I have uh, one daughter. Okay. I had two miscarriages. I had two miscarriages. Okay. Okay. Did they have a clue as to why the miscarriage? I mean, I'm sorry, not the miscarriage. Why the prolapse occurred? Were you straining a lot to have bowel movements? Were you straining a lot no. to urinate? No, they. Um, according to my my gut, you know, my gynecologist, who was my uncle, um, or to no, actually to the doctor who did the. I'm sorry, the, um, the gynecologist and the urologist. They said it was due to the drug my mom took. Okay. You're the first, I think I've worked with one other D DES baby in like the last decade. Yeah. My brother has problems too. Really? What are his, his what are his problems? Um, he has prostate problems. Okay. And he's had them for years. Okay. And he's older than me. Okay. Um, hold on a sec. Um, let me just look at something real quick. Okay. And I'm sorry, what's your first? Jill, name? like Jack and Jill, Jill. Okay. Okay, Jill. Thank you. Or All right. Uh, thank you. Okay. So let's just uh, fill people in on what this is. DES is a man-made form of estrogen a female hormone. Doctors prescribed it from 1938 until 1971 to help some pregnant women who had miscarriages or premature deliveries. At that time, it was believed that these problems might have been caused by low levels of estrogen in the body. DES was used to correct this problem, and it was given to millions of women in the U.S. at the time. Right. Um, DES was used less in the uh, in the 1960s after studies showed it might not help women carry pregnancies to term. <laughs> It was, it was learned that infants whose mothers took DES during the first five months of pregnancy were more likely 
to have problems in their reproductive systems. And it was, uh, the FDA stopped it in 1971. So the people who were exposed to it were mothers, daughters, and sons. And so what are the problems? The people, the uh, primarily breast cancer, an increased risk of breast cancer, about 30% higher. Cervical cancer, vaginal cancer. Did they take your cervix? I probably. You know what? I think so. Yes. Yeah, probably. I'm not. Sure. You know what? I don't know. It can it can cause DS can cause structural changes in the reproductive tract, where you have a vagina, uterus, or cervix with an unusual shape. And that most I did really. Yeah, yeah I had a tipped uterus. A tipped uterus. And the and there can be problems getting pregnant, problems with pregnancy, mis yeah. miscarriage. Yeah. What I don't see here is I'm looking for urinary complications. I understand the gynecological complications, but the urinary complications. Hmm. Well, okay, so your situation is remarkably unique. Um, I, oh, so you're not, you're not a typical muscle injury patient. You're not a typical bladder chemotherapy injury patient. You're not right. gonna, you're not gonna be, at least early on, a chronic UTI patient. You are a DES abnormal hormone. They've, right. do, they've done everything they can to calm that down. Do, do they have you on topical estrogens at, just out of curiosity for your skin or are they saying no estrogen at all? No, I, I take uh, Premarin, the oral tablets. Okay. Every night. Okay. Um, and how is your, how is your skin down there? Is your vulva dry? Are you feeling no. dry? Okay, good. No, not at all. Good. Not at all. Have you noticed? How have you? Think back the last five years. Are your symptoms okay. be, better today or worse today than where they were five years ago? I would say they're worse since the COVID started. Okay. Um. So. I, go ahead. And. This past year, you know, with being in a lot, you know, especially with my age and un other un underlying health issues, yeah. um, you know, my husband and I stay in, we stayed in a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. What, what was that going to lead to? You know, sitting. Uh, I've, I've noticed a lot of flares, you know, a lot of flares. So I was, I really, I live in Virginia. I don't. First, I went to a Euro gynecologist who she did, she wanted to make sure my bladder was empty. She nicked something and she created a massive flare. I wanted oh. to smash her. Then I just recently went to a new practice. I saw the nurse practitioner and she says, Oh, you don't do that. She goes, I would never, you know, see if your bladder was empty. They didn't, uh, ultrasound right she, right she was the one who said take the hydroxine hydroxine okay um, yeah okay but but we can't even talk about treatments yet because we don't understand yeah. your anatomy so we still okay. have to go back to underlying anatomy so there are two okay. so there are two theories that we can operate on right. the, the reason why i asked have you gotten better or worse in the last five years is because you're older and you have estrogen more estrogen atrophy now even though right. you're taking the primer and you have more estrogen atrophy and your bladder needs estrogen to produce mucus. Right. And the, the primer in you're taking is never going to get you back to the bladder of an 18 year old. You still, you are in estrogen atrophy and you have been for decades ever since they did the hysterectomy. Right. So concept number one is that your bladder wall has thinned. Right. And it's just more vulnerable to the foods that you're eating. So it would be good for you to Google the genitourinary syndrome of menopause, also known as GSM, genitourinary okay. syndrome of menopause, because okay. that's really logical. I mean, that has to be going on at your age. 
There's no way it can't. Every woman goes through it. Okay. And that would explain why you're reacting maybe to foods more now than you might have been a couple of years ago is because your bladder just can't defend itself well. Well, the <clears throat> one good thing is um, the beginning of, I gained a lot of weight last, last year because yeah. of COVID. Yeah. And we all did. <laughs> start, yeah, didn't everybody? Um, at the end of January this year, I said, you know what? You got to get a handle on it. Yeah. So I stopped everything white, no yeah. flour, no sugar, no potatoes, only good complex carbs. Yeah. Um, I never had anything acidic ever. And how are you I doing? Well. How are you doing? I feel like I'm doing better. I've lost 20 pounds. Nice. Yeah. Nice. I'd like to lose about 20 more. Okay. Um, and it's hard at my age to lose 20 pounds. It is. It is. I'm um, 60, hon. So. You know, uh, I get well, it. Thank you. you know, <laughs> makeup. <I don't>. Makeup. <laughs> I know I did have makeup on is off now, but um, I, but so. I, I set up everything without my makeup on and I scared myself. I had to go put all my makeup on <laughs> to make this work. Well, OK, so. so diet is important for every woman who's older because your skin just can't defend itself anymore, guys. It can't. It just is what it is. And so. Right. And, you know, some women, they think I can go back to drinking that one cup of coffee or you've been drinking the one cup of coffee a day. And then finally, one day it hurts. It is what it is. And so therapeutically to help restore that, number one is a little bit of estrogen. Number two is a bladder coating of some type. Doing something that will coat and protect the bladder, like bladder builder or bladder rest or cystoprotec or cysto renew something with chondroitin in it that will help give you um, uh, a barrier. Uh, they can do bladder installations. A heparin lidocaine installation would accomplish the same thing, mm. right? So that makes... What is that? What is that? Is that what's it called? A rescue installation. A what is that? It's called a rescue because it rescues you out of a flare. And what they do is they put a numbing agent combined with a coating agent in your bladder. So typically typically it's lidocaine or marcaine combined with heparin. And there, okay. there are a few more ingredients in there. And it's called a rescue for a reason. It will rescue you out of a flare. Most people walk out of the doctor's office pain-free. And it will last for a day or two. And then it, it, everything amps back up. So the protocol for a rescue instilled, one of the published protocols if you're in a wicked flare and you just can't get control is they will do three a week for two weeks. So you have six installations over a two week period. And, and what they're just doing is they're just shutting down the nerves, just calming the nerves down, calm, 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 calm with every installation. And, mm -hmm. and, and so slowly over time, or actually rapidly over time, those nerves do calm and stabilize. So you do a three a week for two weeks, and then you do one a week for a month. And then usually by that time, we're past that flare. Mm -hmm. And so if your flare is not responding to the typical protocols that we use for the bladder wall, which is alkalinizing your urine, increasing your water intake, modifying your diet, doing the supplements, if none of that's working, azo bladder pain relief tablets, if that's not working, then getting in there just fairly aggressively with the bladder wall and, and calming those nerves through a rescue installation would be the next protocol. And you then I'm going to write this down rescue. Oh. Uh, right. Sorry. I said rescue. A rescue oh. installation, rescue installation. Just go on over to our website, IC Network, go into treatments, and it's in step two. And there's a whole page dedicated to it with a whole bunch of formulas. Um, what about, I'm the one, when I recently went to the, uh, I saw the nurse practitioner. She was the one who said to continue the macro bed at bedtime. It's uh, start the hydro. I don't know how to pronounce it, hydroxyzine, hydroxyzine um, 10 milligrams, which I'm afraid to start because I have a heart condition. And in it, 
I don't know. I, I was in the medical field 45 years, so I would, we well, shouldn't read. What's the motive? What's the motivation behind the antibiotics? I don't understand. Why does she want you on an antibiotic? Have you had a positive urine culture in the last year? Um, ironically, when you uh, they did take, they, when I gave a sample, this was last week or two weeks ago, in the sample at the office, I they showed blood in the urine and leukocyte. Luke, Luke, yeah, but know. that's not that's not indicative of infection. We all have leukocytes in your urine. You get you have leukocytes in your urine if you've got a bladder injury, if you drink too much coffee. That's right. just your body your body motivating white blood cells to the area because it's concerned about right. something. But it's really the and nitrites that are more suggestive of infection. So, were you positive for nitrite? Um, I don't know, but they did do a culture yeah. and the culture was not, and the culture, as you said in your, um, right on was normal. Right. Right. So I'm frustrated. I don't know what to take. Well, I think that like I asked, so here we have in our magazine uh -huh. and, and if you email me, uh, my email address is icnetwork at mac.com. If you email me, I will send you this for free so that you can give it okay. to you. You can read it and give it to your doctor. So I asked the one of the top. What, what was the thing? IC Network what? The IC Optimist. It's our magazine. Now, what's the, the email you? IC Network at Mac.com, short for Macintosh Computer. At MAC.com? Right. So the, okay. Amer the American Urology Association specifically excludes the treatment of IC with long-term antibiotics. And my okay. interview with Dr. Lee Stay from Harvard, same thing. They never support the use of long-term antibiotics for IC patients. The only time they would be discussed is if you have viable, verifiable, provable infection in your urine. And you don't have that. Um, okay. When you take an antibiotic, you are destroying your flora. And here's the thing, and you, you know this, you because you are in medicine, you know we have a biome. Right. And one of the old guesses about the biome was that the stomach had no bacteria in it, and that the uh, bladder had no bacteria in it. That these were essentially sterile organs. They're not sterile organs. We have a normal, important urinary biome, just like we have a normal, important bowel biome. And so by you, for you doing the long-term antibiotics just completely cuts your health under, you know, you, you're just cutting off your feet to spite your face for lack of a better term. I mean, right. that's not the right saying, but I don't know any IC doctor who would, who would make that suggestion. Long-term antibiotics are associated with more risk of the development of long-term drug resistant infections and more importantly, right. candida infections. So I have a hard time. I mean, the AUA guidelines for IC specifically exclude it. They are no longer recommended. They do not recommend the use of any long-term antibiotics for IC. So I would, as a patient, be having a hard time with that because they she's okay. she's guessing. She's guessing. She knows I also I have really bad IBS, uh, diverticulitis. Um, and I told her, I said, a lot of times when I get a quote flare, I don't know whether it's an IBS flare yeah. or a UTI or my IC flare. Um, I would love to find a doctor where I live that knows about IC. Where, where do you, where are you? California. Oh, nuts. Yeah. <laughs> where, where are you? Where are you? I'm, I'm in Virginia. So you have the top doctor in the nation, Robert Evans, down at, uh, uh, um, what's the name of the university in North Carolina? Um, Wake Forest, I'm Wake for Forest. He's at Wake Forest. Is there anybody closer? Like near, I'm near mm -hmm. Washington, D.C. Um, we have a database on our website you can look at. You can look up your zip code. Um, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, listen, I got to drop, I got to drop this to a close get, because we got a few more people, but this is what I do? would want to know if I were you. Number one, what is the health of my skin? And right. if my vulva is dry and my vagina is dry, then so is my urethra and so is my bladder. And using a topical estrogen 
It's considered more successful and more safe than using an oral estrogen. Okay. Because oral estrogens circulate throughout the body, whereas topical estrogens stay inside of the skin, stay in the skin. They stay where you, they normally stay where you apply it. So that'd be what I'd want to know, number one. And the fact that your okay. symptoms have gotten worse rather than better over the last five years really suggests that as your estrogen levels are declining, your skin is being affected. And that could explain your symptoms. But the other thing that I would want to know is what is going on with your pelvic floor? Okay. Because you had major surgery. Yes. And you could have some residual muscle tension trigger points that okay. could be causing long-term ischemia. Ischemia is possible. And so oxygen deprivation. So we want to make sure your skin is nice and healthy too. Okay. Would you? I mean, your suggest, muscles are nice and healthy. Would you suggest taking the hydrox? I well, I think know. you need to talk to the pharmacist. I, I would talk to your pharmacist and, and your cardiologist about that. Um, yeah, I did. Because it, it, it affects your heart, correct? Not like an antidepressant. An antidepressant, like an anticholinergic, will absolutely give you a racing heart or an irregular heartbeat, which I had taking amitriptyline. I had no problems tolerating the, the, the hydroxyzine at all. Um, okay. But I, I took a tiny dose. I never yeah, took that, a full dose. I literally yeah. pried the capsule open, put it in a half a cup of water, swirled it up, drank a quarter of a cup, and and then saved the next quarter of a cup for the next time. So yeah, it was, it's ten milligrams. Right, right. Um, and know that if it's the pill that's generic for hydroxyzine hydrochloride, as compared to the capsule, which is hydroxyzine yeah. pamoate. Hydroxyzine hydrochloride tends to be a little bit harder on the body. It tends to be a little bit less pure, whereas the hydroxyzine PAMOA in the capsule is usually better for people who are sensitive. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it's the HCL. The HCL is the challenging one. The PAMOA is the good one. The PAMOA it is the hydroxyzine PAMOA, P-A-M-O-A-T-E. P-A-M what? P A M O A T is in Tom E, Pamoate. So there are okay. two forms of hydroxyzine. And what do you, and, and you, um, I'm sorry, I know you've got other people. What about the, she also recommended bladder ease. Uh, bladder ease is not our first choice uh, because it has some products derived from citrus. Our first, oh, let me show you what our choices are. So the top supplement right now by far is bladder builder. Bladder. Bladder builder. Bladder builder. Okay. And the reason why this is the top supplement is because it has the bladder coating ingredients. It has some okay. beneficial probiotics for the gut, but most importantly, it has PEA in it for pain relief. And we just okay. did a one-year follow-up study with this, and the data was great. 60% of the patients who tried it love it. They're still on it today. 25% are pain-free, and the rest are reporting shorter flares, fewer flares, and less painful flares. For, okay. 40% 40, okay. 40 of the patients who tried this do not take it. The number one reason was cost. The number two reason was the doctor wanted them to try something else. And the number three reason was they had a side effect because any of the chondroitin-based supplements have the potential of irritating your gut. And that is why we always say, go slow, start okay. slow. One capsule, okay. see how you do. One a day for a week, see how you do. You can slowly work your way up, but you might just be fine with one. Okay. An old formula is called Cystoprotec. Cysto. So this formula is about 20 years old. And unfortunately, it's been on a very long extended manufacturer's delay. So we still don't have it. It just got pushed out another month. So this is off the table right now. Okay. A third one is called Bladder Rest. Okay. 
bladder rest is a very simple, clean, pristine formula for people who have a lot of allergies. It's in an avocado ba oil base rather than an olive oil base. So, so it's a bit more heat tolerant and okay. it's, it's about five or $5 cheaper. And then we also have Cisto Mend. This is as close to Cisto Protec um, as, as we have. So quite a few um, Cisto Protec patients are trying Cisto Mend because of the Cisto Protec outage. Just know that the Cisto Mend is a is probably the strongest one of the strongest formulas on the market. It's pretty aggressive, and so the manufacturer's recommended dose of this is six a day, but four a day would be equivalent to Cisto Protec. So, um, you know, please, everybody, do not take the full dose of anything your first day. You're sensitive. We all are. You have to start slow. And find the find the amount that works for you. Um, for me, what would, you, what would you suggest I start with the bladder builder? Uh, do you flare when you take a probiotic or when you um, eat uh, yogurt? Um, no, because okay. I take a probiotic. I take a probiotic. Then I would do bladder builder because bladder builder is the formula that combines the bladder coating with the the pain fighting. So, okay. so bladder builder is the, the top supplement right now, in my opinion, but according to okay. our, our patient feedback also. Okay. Okay. Okay, okay hon. Well, listen, it was very nice Thank to meet you. I wish you very well. Very nice meeting you. I wish I could meet you live in person. You've been wonderful. Well, one day, one day again, we'll start having conferences again and you guys will walk in and you go, oh my God, she's so much older than I thought she was. <laughs> No, 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 no. Um, and I will look for a good urologist here. Sounds good. All right, hon. Okay. Nice talking Thank with you. Thank you so much. You're, I appreciate it. You're very welcome. All right, Linnea. Hello, Linnea. Hi, how are you? I am very, very good. How are you? I'm really good. I, um, yeah, I'm really good. I just checking in to say hi and, and, and I'm still alive and well and back and halfway vaccinated. Me too. Which one did you get? I got the Moderna and I got a little bit of a, a, a reaction the second day and then the sixth day a rash, but I'm sensitive. You got I'm you got a sensitive. you got a rash on the sixth day? Yeah, I had a rash on the sixth where, day. Where where was the day. rash? Right on the injection spot. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, huh. Yeah, it was about the size of my iPhone. It was red. It kind of had hives. It was hot. I took my friend just the day before it sent me an infrared thermometer and I took, you know, temperature on both arms and it was hot there. It was like, but I'm sensitive. Huh. You know? Uh huh. Did you let your doctor know that that happened? No, I didn't even bother. Oh, you should. There was huge articles in the newspaper about people having rash that came out that day. Oh, okay. Um, I, whether it was the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or the Washington Post, I don't remember which. Okay. Because I look at, yeah, there was, you know, rashes, very common. So I didn't even bother. Okay. And, uh, I had the, yeah. yeah, I had the Pfizer. So, um, and hey, let me just stop for a moment. Betty says, what works for spasms? Betty, um, it depends on where you're spasming. If you're spasming in your bladder, it's going to, we need a smooth muscle relaxant. That's going to be Detrol or Ditropan. If you're, if you're spasming in your pelvic floor, that's going to be a skeletal muscle relaxant. That's going to be Valium, Baclofen, or Flexerol. All right. Sorry, I what just wanted to catch of, that in. What can, what can I take instead of pre-leak? To alkalinize your urine. Uh, you can use Tums. Uh, or you could use like a quarter teaspoon of baking soda in a glass of water. Okay. Okay. Those would be the top choices. Um, there's one other that sometimes doctors recommend that starts with a C. I don't remember what it is. I don't, I don't remember that. It's very rarely used, but anyway. I get time, every once in a while, I get a tiny bit of GERD. So the Tums would probably be the preferable you know, thing anyway. And, and I, you know, I think I get, um, I get GERD too. Um, if I eat too much and you know how your, your stomach is like telling you stop here and you're like going, but I, no, I want, a, it tastes so good. Yeah, I want I have, a little bit more. Yeah. 
I have a, a, a thing, a hypermobility thing mm -hmm. with my collagen, mm -hmm. Ehlers Daniels hypermobility disorder. And so I think my stomach can stretch way more than other people because I'm a tiny little person. Yeah. And I can, I can eat a lot, especially pandemic stress. <laughs> oh, I know. Cinnamon rolls have never tasted better. I'll tell you what I use for that is Gaviscon. Gaviscon is the bomb. Show so me a pic. Show me it. Okay, hold on. I'll take a screenshot. Okay, let me switch to X. Okay, guys. Okay. All right. Good. Thank you. I took a screenshot. So what happens with Gaviscon, the reason why this is recommended is because it creates a foamy layer on top of your stomach that prevents the GERD. It prevents your stomach contents from going up into your esophagus. And so I haven't, it's really rare that I, I have any esophageal pain anymore. As soon as I feel anything, I, and, and it has a great okay. flavor too. I mean, it's just, it's just chewables. Okay. But they're, right. but they're much, it's much better than my Lanta or any of those other heavy, thick. Yeah. I used to, I used to take aspirin, this buffered aspirin when I was a teenager. Mm -hmm. They didn't know why I had pain, but I, I've overcome fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue, chronic facial pain syndrome, and I've pretty much overcome the, the IBS and the IC. So um, I'm, a, I'm the doctor's miracle person. I'm like positive mental attitude all the way. And it's diet, diet, diet. I've been gluten free for 20 years. That made a huge difference. Grats. I'm so envious when you said cinnamon rolls. I'm like, oh, okay. Here comes somebody. I know. I, and I don't know who this is. Okay, Linnea. Well, listen, you're doing so well. Congratulations. I wish you the best. Um, I don't know this person who's coming in. Um, oh, so, um, Nathaniel, I'm in. Nathaniel yeah, okay. are you, if you're an IC patient, can you please put that in the chat? Otherwise, um, I can't turn you on. Nope. He's They're gone. gone. <laughs> okay. All right. All right, All right my right, friends. Here. Thank you so much. Take care. Okay. We're going to end zoom. All right. The zoom meeting is over. I always worry if somebody comes into Zoom meeting and they're going to, they're going to, you know, show us their booty. <laughs> you know, it's going to happen eventually. All right. Let me, uh, let me get this back up here. All right, YouTube. What have I missed here? Betty says, I can't tell where the spasms are located because they are associated with an IBS flare. Could you please repeat the anti-spasmodics? I've been using hyo So. Um, um, are they rectal, are they bowel or rectal spasms? Do you only have the spasms right before a bowel movement? Are they the same spasms you get when you're going to, when you're cramping and you're going to have the runs? Anissa on, on Facebook says that Dr. Evans is the best. Yeah, he is. He's been voted number one every year we've had. Doctor of the Year, and I've got to do it. I'll be doing that probably uh, in the next two weeks, going through all the votes. Carolyn says, I always learn so much from these meetings. Happy to help, Carolyn. Happy to help. Annie says, she loves Dr. Elise Day in Boston. I've seen her several times for my IC. All righty. All righty. Buddy is asking on YouTube, are there good benefits from bladder Botox? Well, there can be, but they, it's coming with risk. Uh, Botox is a step four treatment option for a reason. You know, the steps, the treatment options are arranged with respect to the risk of adverse event. You know, they don't want you to do the hard stuff until you do the easy stuff. They want you to do things that are safe first. So the reason why Botox is in step four is that if they numb the wrong nerve accidentally, you will not be able to pee for weeks or months. And so there is a significant risk to using Botox. And 
if you are unable to self-catheterize, the FDA says you should not be given Botox. And that's weird because they're doing a lot of Botox in nursing homes with very elderly people who don't have a bad chance in hell of catheterizing. Um, so there you go. Letty says, lidocaine burns me. Why will the rescue be different from the gel? Well, if, if lidocaine burns you, they can switch to Marcaine, hon. Marcaine is a different anesthetic that is more tolerable than lidocaine. Lidocaine is a short-term antibiotic. Marcaine is a long-term antibiotic. Jay says, Dr. Evans is three and a half hours away from where I live, and he is the best closest to me. Very understanding. Wish he was closer to where I live. Yeah, he is. Rhonda says, my daughter was told she's allergic to a man's sperm. Same thing they told me years ago. I told her no. Put her on macrobed. Okay, so Rhonda. Rhonda. Okay. That allergy actually happens. Some women are allergic or sensitive to a man's sperm. Uh, we call that honeymoon cystitis, but it's real. And, and I'm thinking that, hold on a sec. I know, I know that I just saw a new discussion of that. Um, I'm wondering if it's in this book. You know, and it, oh God, where did I see that? I did see a discuss. Hmm. Is it in, where did I see that discussion? Hold on, maybe it was in this book. Honeymoon cystitis. You know, there are a group of women whose symptoms begin on their honeymoon. And, you know, because we have to understand that when you're on your honeymoon, you're having a lot of sex and you might be sitting in a hot tub or you might be in the ocean. So having sex, sitting in a hot tub, which might be contaminated and then sex pushes bacteria up into your bladder, that's possible. But it's also possible that, that that patient might be reacting to their husband's sperm. Although it's, God dang it, where did I see that? It was in this obscure location. I, I'll need to see if I can find that. Um, yeah, here it is. Here it is. It's called seminal plasma hypersensitivity. It's an allergic reaction to the proteins found in most men's sperm. It's a rare condition affecting up to 40,000 women in the US. It's unclear how extensively this condition affects men who have sex with men. Studies do show that it's possible to be allergic to your own semen. When this happens, it's known as post-orgasmic illness syndrome. So what are the symptoms? Redness, burning, swelling, pain, hives, and itching. For women, the symptoms usually occur on the vulva or inside the vagina. It can also happen on skin that comes in contact with sperm, so on your hands, wherever. In severe cases, it can even cause difficulty breathing, wheezing, swollen tongue, a real allergic reaction. So they say the best defense is to use a condom. Some research also suggests that certain medications or food allergens found in sperm can trigger allergens. It's possible for the allergy to develop in women who haven't had any prior symptoms. You might also experience symptoms with one partner and not the other. Although semen allergies can develop at any time, many women report 
that their symptoms began in their early 30s. So Rhonda, so the so um, you should not assume that macrobid would be a bad choice. I mean, or a good choice. Uh, macrobid would do nothing for an allergy. What would be interesting for an allergy would be an antihistamine. So I would encourage you and her to look at, I found this information on Healthline, healthline.com. Uh, take a look at that because don't assume that they're making it up. It's real. It's rare, but it's real. And um, uh, my mom ha had that. Um, even though she had three children, it was an issue for her. So... Um, anyway, you know, the things we're learning these days, it may be that something that, that, that your partner was eating that you're sensitive to that we ended up in the proteins and sperm. I mean, it's just fascinating, right? All right. The things you learn, the things you learn, right? Okay. Getting back to Betty, who's having spasms with IBS. So it sounds like you're having bowel spasms. And so, uh, yeah, Levson. Levson would normally be what they would do. And, and I think that that's what you're doing when I had. But also, hun, let me, let me just share with you, Betty, that my IBS began in my 20s. It began in my 20s. And prior to that, I didn't really have a lot of food problems. I mean, I was, you know, eating chocolate and all sorts of things like that. And then just kind of like one day out of the blue, I remember the exact day, I, I can tell you the exact day I had my first IBS attack. I was working for the feds. I was a, because I didn't go to med school. So I was a, a black lung specialist for social security disability. That was my first job. And I only did that a year before I went back to grad school. Um, but I had my first attack at work. It was in the morning on my break. I went down to the cafeteria and I got a chocolate chip cookie and I got milk. And I was on the bathroom floor for hours with bowel spasms. Like, oh, like I call them bend over and screamers so bad. And it was an oatmeal chocolate chip cookie. And it just progressed. And then whenever I went out to eat, I would have diarrhea 30 minutes later. Uh, and this went on for a couple of years. And then I started getting sick over the holidays and over Thanksgiving. And it ruined a couple of Christmases for me where I just felt so ill. And then you can't deny ex explosive diarrhea doesn't come from your brain. I mean, it was real. And I was out on a date with a guy that that we were talking about getting married and it happened. And I felt so bad that 45 minutes later, I was hiding in the bathroom with this diarrhea from this IBS thing. So my doctors were just, you need more fiber, you need to eat oatmeal every day, yada, yada, yada. And I did that the whole time and I was just getting worse. Um, and then my sister gave me a book, which I still have somewhere. And it was about food allergies and food sensitivities. And I had never heard of a food sensitivity. I mean, this was back in the 80s when I was in my 20s. And so what it said is stop the dairy, which I had already done. I knew that I was, if I was eating a lot of dairy, things were a little bit more crampy. So I'd already stopped the dairy and I, st I don't drink milk to this day. But the second thing it said is stop all the grains except rice. And within 24 hours of doing that, it went away. It went away. So I stopped the corn. I started stopped the oats, stopped the wheat. Only thing I was allowed to eat was rice. Did that for a week. But literally within a day, it had stopped. I had bend over and screamers every morning at 10 or 11 o'clock in the morning. I mean, it was awful. So stopping the grain was fascinating because it, I, my symptoms completely stopped. And then they had us introduce our grains back. And as soon as I reintroduced oatmeal, bam, it's back. It's back. I have a sensitivity to oatmeal. What did my doctor tell me to do every day? Eat oatmeal. 
I wanted to get better. I had oatmeal every morning. I sprung, I, I sprinkled oat flakes on everything I ate. Every morning I had bend over and screamers. The cramping was insane. It was so bad. Like I could not walk in the fetal position, laying on the bathroom floor. And that's when the book taught me about food sensitivities and the fact that there are some foods that your body simply does not know how to process. It's not a real allergy. You're not, your throat is not swelling. You're not breaking out in hives, but it's like your body interprets it as poison. And that's what happened. Wherever the oatmeal was in my stomach, it cramped all the way through. I could tell, I could tell you exactly where it was from high to low, left to right. I knew where it was because wherever it was happening, my bowel was spasming. And so I did their elimination diet and found two primary sensitivities. Number one was oatmeal. Number two was chocolate. And my, in my family, we had a tradition that we got a two pound box of C's candy on Thanksgiving. And we each had every day through Christmas, one piece of candy for dessert. And that candy just destroyed me between the oatmeal and the candy. So I stopped the oatmeal, kept doing the candy. Uh -uh, I couldn't do that either. So I think that if I could go back in time, Betty, I would want to do something called an ALCAT food sensitivity test. That's A-L-C-A-T. An ALCAT food sensitivity test will, and it's a blood test, uh, will identify foods that might be triggering those spasms, okay? So let's not just treat the spasm. Let's try to figure out what the what's causing the spasm. And now that uh, I don't do that, I don't eat oatmeal, I don't eat chocolate, and then I also, I don't eat lettuce. Uh, whenever I, I would go out with my girlfriends for lunch, have a chef salad or, you know, a Caesar salad or Cobb salad or whatever. And inevitably I would have IBS after that too, but I was never sure if it was sulfites from the lettuce or something, you know, kind of not so good in it. But I know that I do better when I don't do lettuce. And so those are the three things that I actively avoid. And I'm so much healthier. I can't even remember the last time I had bowel spasms, like once in a blue moon, maybe once every two years. And that's usually because I've eaten something Then I go back, I can feel it. And I'm like, go back and look at it and go, oh my God, it has oatmeal in it or something like that. You know, if somebody buys a new bread and I eat the bread, it, yeah. So Betty, let's, I, I think that talking to an allergist and or maybe having an LCAP food sensitivity test could be life-changing. I mean, it was life-changing. It took me a lot of work. It took me three years to figure out what my triggers were and to get over that. Now I avoid those triggers and I no longer have the IBS. Okay. So there you go. Shell says, I saw an article about lidocaine infusions. I wonder if it would help I, uh, I see. Um, lidocaine's really dangerous, hon. I can't imagine that. I mean, they, they're certainly not going to do a lidocaine infusion in your bloodstream. But I know that Dr. Jerome Weiss did subcutaneous lid, lidocaine infusion. So what he did. Okay. And you're going to see my fat stomach. I have a fat stomach right now. So on. Um, when he, so he evaluated nerves in addition to muscles. And so in addition to, to touching your muscles to see if your muscles were tight, he always looked at the skin above and was the skin healthy? Was there pins and needles in the skin? Was there any tenderness touching the skin? And he found that in some patients, there was sensitivity directly underneath the skin right here. And so he did subcutaneous lidocaine infusions there to calm the nerves down in that area. But you have to be really careful with lidocaine. People have died you getting too much lidocaine, even absorbed through your skin. Like you would never put lidocaine on your skin and wrap it in plastic. You would never do that. That's not healthy. There was uh, several cases 
20 years ago of women in Florida specifically who underwent liposuction and they put lidocaine on their skin and wrapped them with plastic and they died. They got too much lidocaine in their bloodstream. This is Cynthia says, I have urgency and burning in my bladder. Are these alone symptoms of IC? How is pelvic pain? Sometimes I don't understand because I don't feel pain. I only constant urgency on the tip of the urethra and burning in the bladder. So honey, um, um, burn, so there are a couple of things that we'd be looking at for you. Very first thing, since you're having pain at your urethra, we're really going to look first at the quality and health of your skin. If you have estrogen atrophy, it's going to manifest in the urethra. That's the canary in the coal mine. So if you're on birth control or you are in your 40s or 50s or older where you're in a perimenopause, menopause or postmenopause, uh, the very first place that women normally feel that is in the urethra. And it feels like there's a drop of urine stuck in your urethra. Your urethra gets really, 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 really irritated. And so I would want to know, number one, what is the quality and health of your skin? And do you have estrogen atrophy? Um, As I, as I said before, um, in, in this magazine, our latest magazine, which just came out last, late last week, um, there's a whole article on urgency. And I read part of it earlier, um, uh, earlier today. So you, urgency is caused by the alpha afferent nerve in your bladder wall. It's a nerve that's very easy to turn on and kind of hard to turn off. So what turns it on? Number one, bladder irritants, food, anything that triggers nerves like caffeine, chocolate, citrus, vitamin C, uh, green tea, black tea, soda. Those would all be irritating to the skin, especially as you're getting older. We would want to look at your muscles. Are your muscles tight? Are your levator ani muscles tight uh, around your urethra? And you can see this here in this diagram. So here's your pelvis, right? Your shallowest muscles at the bottom are called your levator anis, and they have three holes in them, rectum, vagina, urethra. If this muscle is tight, it's going to cause burning in the urethra, and it's going to make it hard for you to pee. If you can't start your urine stream right away, if you have to sit there 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 seconds before you can relax enough to let your urine out, you have tight muscles. So think about, you can get this magazine right now on our website. Uh, if you email me, I'll, I'll send it to you, no charge. icnetwork at mac.com. icnetwork at mac.com. Cindy says, is 5% topical lidocaine gel safe to use on the urethra? A lot of doctors prescribe topical lidocaine, not only at the urethra, but also on the, on the vulva. I have used that myself. So um, Cynthia says she's 40 with eczema and acne. Um, another thing that I would be looking at, Cynthia, honestly, is chemical injury. So um, uh, do you wear a pad every day? So if you're wearing a menstrual pad every day or a mini pad every day, that's sucking the natural moisture out of your skin. And that could cause some sensitivity in the urethra. So don't wear a mini pad every day, you know, unless you, unless you really are leaking, even if you feel like you're leaking, but you're not, your skin is meant to be moist down there. And that pad is going to pull moisture out of there. I would be looking at laundry detergent. Uh, have you changed laundry detergent recent, recently? I know if I wore underwear washed and tied or cheer, I had urethral burning within the, the next 10 minutes or so. I do better with seventh generation natural. Uh, you know, a, a more natural uh, laundry detergent rather than a chemically driven laundry detergent. So look at the laundry detergent. Do you, uh, Also, the other thing I would want to know is, do you use fabric softeners? Do you use dryer sheets? Anything that leaves a chemical smell in your laundry should not be used because it's coating the fabric with chemicals, which could irritate your vulva and your urethra. So, so let's look at those chemical irritants. I would also want to know if you're using a spermicide. You might be reacting to a new spermicide. So I have an article on our website. If you go to icnetwork.org 
and, and search for urethra. I have an article called The Seven Causes of Urethra Pain. Take a look at that. Take a look at that. Rhonda says, I'm very interested in food sensitivity, lettuce I can't, spasms in the pelvis, chocolate chips really did me in. I cannot have them or my pelvis tightens up. You have, okay, so girl, you've got the same sensitivities that I do, uh, but it's not an allergy, it's a sensitivity, they're different. You're not breaking out in rashes when you're eating them or your throat isn't swelling or you're having trouble breathing. It's more an intolerance that your body just basically interprets it as kind of like poison. And I think a lot of it's hereditary. I mean, like, look at me. I'm a redhead from Norway and Sweden. A uh, chocolate comes from Africa. I mean, I, I, I truly believe that my body just doesn't know how to process chocolate and it doesn't know how to process oatmeal. Rhonda says, I swear I have allergies to foods. I really struggle with safe foods. It's getting out of hand where to go for food sensitivity. Uh, no oatmeal or chocolate chips or lettuce. Well, hon, everybody's different. This is where you got to do the work because remember, my ancestry is different than your ancestry. Your body is the result, the sum total of, of your ancestry. And it was designed for life 5,000 years ago. So you almost have to go back to where your family cam, came from to really see what your body is meant to thrive on. Right? And so my family is from northern, northern Norway and Sweden. And so my body is built for fish, which I happen to hate, which is ridiculous. And uh, berries, which I happen to love. Um, and there, were, there was no chocolate in Northern Norway 5,000 years ago. There was no caffeine. There was no coffee. There was no tea. Nothing like that. If I have caffeine, I shake like a leaf for two days. It makes my heart crazy. You know, and so you got to look at your ancestry too, and that might give you clues as to, you know, what your body is, is kind of built for versus not built for. I hope that makes sense. And it's just trial and error. I mean, and it honestly, it took me like two years to really figure it out with an elimination diet. But the big thing was the grains. Man, just losing the grains and going on to rice for a week. Oh, God, things calmed down so much. Um, and, and it's hard because, and, and I think, you know, this is true. This is true for all of us that when you're food reactive, food is not your friend. And so much of our social life is based on food and meals and, um, and dating and going out to dinner and going out to dinner and going to a movie or going out to dinner and going into a play. That's hard when you're food reactive. Um, and I think what's sad is that we, we lose a lot of social opportunity. Um, and so you, you kind of, so I don't, I don't like to play with foods and new restaurants. I don't, I want to go, I mean, I've got like five or six restaurants in my town that I know I can trust. And that's where I go. If a new rest and it, or if a new restaurant opens up, you know, I'm going to be really careful about what I get. I'm certainly not going to order a salad because God forbid it be treated with sulfites. That's a massive IBS trigger. So um, you have to do the work and then you've got to rebuild trust and you rebuild trust by Focusing on the restaurants that you know you can trust because of how they prepare the food and the food that they offer. So I have my Italian restaurant that I can use. I got my pizza joint that I can use. I've got my, I've got an Asian place that I can use. I've got the hamburger place that I can use and a German place which closed, which I used to be able to use. You know, and it, it, it sucks. I mean, there's, grief, you know, I, there's grief associated with it to a certain point. And it's hard. Like I, I would never agree to eat first and then go to a movie. I, or if I do, I will always drive myself so that I, if I have an attack, 
I would, I could drive myself home. Right. I never wanted to inconvenience somebody else. And so if that's what the group wanted to do, eat first, it's like, okay, but I'm going to drive myself. And if I have to leave, don't take it personally. It just means the food disagreed with me. I hope that makes sense. Shell says, how do we go about having a one-on-one -on -one with you? I have limited time to do work, but would love to arrange something. Um, Shell, you can just, you can call our 1-800 number, 1-800-928-7496. It's on the top of our Facebook page. It's at the top of our website and go to the um, patient support line. The first option is the store. The second option is the corporate office and the third, and that's for doctors and people like that. And the third option is patient support. So do that one. And if you get me, great. And if you don't get me, that just means that I'm working with somebody else and it's a first come first serve situation. Um, the only way you get put to the top of the list above everybody else is if you sign up for coaching because that's paid for. But um, I work with people paid for and not paid for all the time. If you want to spend a lot of time going over your history and we're going to have like an hour long discussion, then yeah, I'm going to ask, I'm going to ask you to sign up for coaching most likely. But if you just have a quick question, you know, five or 10 minute convo, just call. And if you get me, that's great. Be happy to try to help. I just have a lot of stuff I'm not getting done now because I'm on the phone all the time. <laughs> Shell says, I got a rasp allergy test, mainly for eosinophilic esophagitis. It was eye-opening for me. Wheat and shrimp allergies and dairy sensitivity. Interesting. Very, very interesting. I'm really glad you got that allergy blood test. So now that you've avoided, you avoid the wheat and the dairy and the shrimp, are you, are you better? All right, let's do, uh, so we've been going on for three hours now, uh, which is a good, good time. I want to, I, and I'm assuming that those of you who stuck around, uh, that you're having a bad day today. And so I want to do something to see if we can help. So um, I let's try some tapping. Now, remember, I talked about this earlier that what brain scans show for patients with chronic overlapping pain conditions, and I'm one of them, is that our brains are often stuck in fight or flight. We've been doing brain scans for a decade in the United States. And, you're, and the brain of somebody with chronic overlapping pain conditions, NIC, and vulvodynia, and IBS, and TMJ is different. It's living in fight or flight. It's like we're scared all the time. And the normal process, which calms it down, is not engaging. The sympathy, the amygdala in the brain, which is what controls fight or flight, is stuck in the on position. It's not turning itself off. So how do we turn that off? The way we turn it off is by engaging our senses. We have to get the brain to focus on other things. And when, we fo when we, we're forcing the brain to pay attention to what we're touching or listening to, it's forcing the amygdala off and the parasympathetic nervous system on. And so I wanna, I wanna try this. Let's guys, you got nothing to lose but pain. What the hell, let's give it a shot. It's called tapping. <laughs> Deronda says, yes, turn it off, please. <laughs> okay, so how do we turn off the amygdala? We're gonna get... We're going to force the brain to pay attention to something else instead. We're going to do that by touching different parts of our body. Okay. So with tapping, we're going to do a sequence of gentle taps, right? Gentle taps. And now normally when you do tapping, you can also, this is also a great opportunity for you to reinforce some affirmations. And that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. So let's you, let's pick an affirmation. Um, uh, what can we do? What would be a good affirmation? Um, okay. Well, so let's be blunt. 
And I went through this in my 20s. I really thought I was damaged goods. I really thought I was unworthy. I really thought that I was being punished because I didn't understand any of it back then. And so even though I was in grad school and I was getting a degree in psychology underneath it all, one of the reasons why I got a degree in psychology was trying to figure out what the hell was wrong with me. Now I know what was wrong. It, it, it's central sensitization, you know, and that's good. That history matters. Context matters. But the negative self-talk is extreme. I am unworthy. I am unlovable. I am, you know, um, my husband should leave me. My wife should leave me. You know, who would ever love me? You know, you get those constant negative, that negative self-talk. I don't want you to do that. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to work on negative self-talk while we do our tapping. So we're going to start here with the karate chop spot. So right here. When you give a karate chop, it goes right here. So I want you to do it with me. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, and, and then say to yourself, um, I see has not changed me. I'm a good woman. I'm a good man. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I see has not changed me. I've done absolutely nothing wrong. I am proud of the woman I am today. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I am healthy and strong. Thank you, Maddie. There you go. I am healthy and strong. So look at this. So we force because of this pain. It doesn't hurt, but we're forcing our brain to go, what the hell is happening with her hands? All right. Now we're going to go here, right at the beginning of the eyebrows. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I am healthy and strong. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I am healthy and strong and smart. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I am healthy and strong. Okay. Now we're going to go to, oh, out to here. You go, so you're not, you're not doing your temples. You go to the bone right next to your temples. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I am healthy and strong and lovable. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I am healthy and strong and smart. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I am healthy and strong and deserve the best that life has to offer. Okay, now we're going to go here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I am healthy and strong. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I am healthy and strong and deserve what, the best in life. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I am healthy and strong and I'm a good woman. And I give a lot to my family. I'm a valid and important part of my family. Okay, now we're going to go here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I am healthy and strong and lovable. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I am healthy and strong. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I am healthy and strong and wise beyond my years. Now we're going to go here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I am healthy and strong. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I've never been more prepared to deal with whatever happens to me than I am at this very moment because truly I'm one day older and one day wiser. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Be bold and mighty forces shall come to thy aid. All right now we're going to do under the arm, right on your bra line. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, God, look at that pattern. Okay. I think I need to work on that. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I'm healthy and strong, and it's okay if I have a slightly fat arm. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I am healthy and strong. Last but not least, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I am healthy and strong. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I am healthy and strong. You see, I'm doing that. I'm doing it right here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. I am healthy and strong and I am a catch. My husband is a lucky man. Shell, I love it. <laughs> I love it. Now, now I want you to think about how do you feel right now doing that? When you touch different parts of your body like that repetitively, it's, a, it's intentional and it is attentional. It is catching the attention of your brain. Your brain's trying to figure out what the hell is happening with all these, all this touching. And so you're redirecting your brain away from the anxiety and away from the negative thinking into trying to process your day-to-day -day stuff. 
And it's kind of the same as like I had to have an MRI in, in December for my, I've got two ruptured discs in my back and um, uh, getting through an MRI, especially a narrow tube MRI where like the you're in there and it's like right here. <laughs> Some people can't do it. I mean, it's just too hard. And I was just, I was just laying there and I, what was I doing? Um, I did, uh, I did I spy and I wasn't moving a lot, but I was, I was, I was doing a little bit of tapping, you know, cause I could do my legs. Um, and then I, I was counting to seven. I was counting by sevens, seven, 14, 21, 28, 35, 42, 49, 56. Right. And I got all the way through to about 800 before they were done. But what was so interesting was that um, I didn't I didn't panic. If I stopped counting, I could feel the stress. So I just went right back to counting. And that's the power of occupying your brain. Um, you know, one of the interesting things is how our brain changes as we cha as we grow up. And they know, for example, that if you grow up with music and you're a musician, your brain is very different than somebody who didn't grow up with music. And and um, but also that your brain is remarkably responsive and um, malleable. And so doing things that will support brain health. Oh, Shell says, I sing during MRIs. God, you know what? I love to sing. I used to drive through this dark forest on the way. I used to live in Fort Bragg. I lived in Fort Bragg for a year, setting up out here in California. I had to drive through this really dark, long redwood grove. And it was like five miles of like murder, murder scene. And I just sang Christmas carols the entire time. That's a great idea because they want me to do another MRI and EMG. It was just at the doctor on Thursday. Don't know if I want to do that, but we'll see. Rhonda says, wow, that worked. Thank you, Jill. I don't know if it would work alone. Is there a class that does this? Um, uh, it's called mindfulness or mind-body medicine. Mind-body medicine. And you can look for books. Uh, you can see if you can find a, a mind body medicine specialist. Um, and um, uh, if you get our last magazine, not the current one, but the last one, I go over several techniques. Uh, but there are many, many more, uh, many, many more. And, you know, I, I mean, I think the challenge here is that when we get offended, if a doctor says, hey, you got to learn to manage your anxiety better or or, hey, you got to do this or you got to do that. And it's like, don't don't talk to me about going to a psychologist. Man, my bladder screaming. Help me with my bladder. And that's how I felt when my doctor first suggested it at my very first appointment and made a referral to psychiatry. He didn't he didn't. He didn't explain it well. What he should have said is, all right, here's a, here's the scoop here. Jill, you have IBS, you have IC, you have a history of vulvodynia, you have very sensitive skin, you've got TMJ, you've got chronic overlapping pain conditions. So what do we know about chronic overlapping pain conditions? We know that your nervous system is amped up and you're in anxiety. You're, it's forcing your brain to be in an anxious state. So what we have to do therapeutically is calm your nervous system down. And that's where mind-body medicine works. We don't just want to give you pills like an antidepressant. We need to give you the skills that you need to calm your brain. And that's what mind-body... And given all the freaking side effects with antidepressants and the side effects with some of these meds, you know, constipation, like, holy hell to actually know how to center your body and to center yourself and calm yourself in a period of stress, doing that deep breathing, taking them. I was watching, they were doing a, uh, 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 before stream while I was eating breakfast, they were doing a half pipe um, contest, getting ready for the Olympic qualifying. And I, and I was watching the skiers, um, as they were getting ready, like they were positioned on their snowboards and the guy who won for like 
15 seconds, he just, you could see him do a, you could see him doing that. It's like 19 year old. And he just calmed and centered. And once he got that point where he was relaxed and not anxious, he took off and oh my God, he was awesome. There's a great, uh, Gwen says, Rhonda, there's a great book at the library I ended up buying on tapping. It's called Step-by-Step -Step Tapping by Sue Beer and Emma Roberts. Yeah, man, I just really want to dive into that a lot more. I mean, now that I have the context, now that, number one, I understand it's not my fault. I understand that I, I'm not being punished. I understand that I didn't do anything wrong, that I have, I was born with the genetics of my ancestors. I am Norwegian and Swedish. I have very specific dietary limitations because of that, but I also have sensitive skin. That's genetic. Small fiber polyneuropathy, that in all likelihood is genetic. But then I, I did also suffer a pretty physical, a physical injury that triggered a lot more stuff. And... You know, the, there's a wonderful gift of hindsight, and that is you get to stop questioning yourself. You get to stop punishing yourself. You get to stop thinking that you deserve to be punished, which is kind of, I was trying to explain that to my sister last week. I mean, at my worst, when I was like 25, and honestly, like the bowel spasms were ridiculous, and I just, wasn't eating and I was ruining holidays for everybody because I was sick and they would want me to go to my sister's house for, for Christmas. And I like, okay, I'll get there, but I'm going to have to lie down in her bedroom. And I'd get there and lie down in her bedroom and they, people would go, what's wrong with Jill? And it's just like, Oh, you know, it was just crazy. And, and it was brutal. It was, I understand why people give up because I, you know, I understand that, but you know, they say, you know, diamonds are made by heat and I don't know, man, one day there were two incidents that made me fight. And I think this is important and I want to share it. Um, I had a doctor say to me, you will forever be a burden on your family. You will always live with this pain. Get used to it. This is your life. And I went, wait, wait, wait. Number one, this is below the waist. This is not above the waist. I have three college degrees. I have an award from the White House. I, this does not change my intelligence at all. I will prove you wrong, you son of a bitch. How dare you say that to me? And that was the moment I started fighting back. I started fighting back. And I dove into the research. I dove into the books. I read everything I could have possibly read. Because I was not going to be a burden on my family. No way, no, he no way in hell was I going to let that happen. And as cruel as that was, I needed that. That was a blessing that he said that to me. Because up to that point, I was just doing nothing. I mean, I was just suffering. I, went, I wasn't proactive. I was reactive. I was passive. I was a patient. I wasn't an active participant in my care. I was just walking into the doctor's office going, "What? help me. I don't know what to do. Help me. And But I wasn't walking into the doctor's office informed. I wasn't walking into the doctor's office knowledgeable about anything, which is silly, you know? I mean, I should have known more. I mean, granted, you know, with I, I did know more than most people at that time, but still, I wasn't invested. And he forced me to become invested. He forced me to be proactive and to fight back kind of a theme of my life, fighting back, fighting, fighting for people, fighting against those who would classify me in a certain way. Um, but there was one other thing that changed my life that I think is important to share. And, and again, this was when I was in my twenties and, you know, 
people often think you, you're supposed to know what you want to do in your 20s. And honestly, I was I've been dealing with so many medical issues. I I I just I didn't know, right? I just didn't know. And and again, the all the health issues, I was pretty depressed and somebody gave me a book and it was about, and the first chapter just ripped me to threads. It was about how will you be remembered when you're gone? And it said, write, write down right now how you think you will be remembered. And I was just bawling my eyes out. It's like, I would be remembered as a complainer. I would be remembered as the family burden. I would be remembered as somebody who didn't care about others because she was so, so self-absorbed with herself, with her pain. And I wrote this and I was just sobbing, just like, oh my God, if I died tomorrow, nobody would care. Nobody would care. They'd be happy to lose me at that point in time. And I was devastated because I didn't feel like I'd really done anything worthwhile that was worth remembering. So then the next chapter was, okay, how do you want to be remembered? Make a list. And I was like, okay, I want to be remembered as kind. I want to be remembered as a person who would stop if somebody was hurt. I want to be remembered as a person who would stop and help an animal that had been hit by a car. I want to be remembered as a person who was not self-absorbed, but tried to help others at every opportunity. And I wrote this list of how I wanted to be remembered. And then the next line was, well, there's your plan. That's what you do. Start tomorrow. Start tomorrow. Um, it was life-changing. It was life-changing because when you have your plan and it's not big things, it's little things. It literally is on Christmas Eve, seeing a car, a cat hit by your best friend driving her car and you pull over and you grab this cat and you knock on doors. I did that on Christmas Eve. Or if you see somebody at the store who can't do something, there is such power in turning off self and focusing on others. Random acts of kindness are so important. I think that whoever is in your life that is important to you, you need to surprise once a month with something. And you're not buying their affection, you're expressing your love. And so making cookies, everybody's gone, you're at home, your bladder's acting up, you just don't want to go do something, fine. Do something for them. Make their favorite cookie. You don't have to eat them. You put make chocolate chip cookies, it's fine. You don't have to eat it. Or come and help somebody online that you see. And don't talk about you, although I'm doing that right now. Help them. Help them. If there's something they need help with, try to help them. And, you know, it's, I think that we are diamonds, diamonds in the rough. But like as Shell says, community service is good for the soul. It is. It really is. But it also gives you contacts. I mean, because... You know, when I started my support group in September of 1993, and I was still basically bedbound, um, I thought I was absolutely the worst person with IC in the country, if not in California, if not the country. And then I connected up with the ICA and we started a support group and I started talking to other patients again from my bed. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> oh wait a second you're really not as bad as you think you are when you start talking to other people and having that contact matters. That's why going to a support group is really nice because it kind of gets you out of your head a little bit. And it's like, Oh, wait a second. Oh, you know what? Mine really isn't. I can sleep for three hours at a time. She's getting up every 10 minutes. You know what? 
I'm pretty good. Now let's see what we can do to help her. But context matters. And that's where Facebook is hard. And that's where the internet is hard because there are lots and lots of groups, but you often share a lot of negative stuff, but it's, it's not, it's, there's not real context there because you could have somebody with Hunter's lesions. You could have somebody with chemocystitis. You could have somebody who is sexually abused. You could have somebody with a chronic fungal infection or viral infection all in the same group and you're feeding a lot of negativity. And that doesn't really get you very far. It's really important to turn off the computer, open up the drapes. You can see the drapes are open in here. Get outside, take a walk, help the elderly neighbor unload the, you know, groceries from her car, or better yet, go grocery shopping for her. And, and let's just try to build the life you want, the, the life you want, the light, the way you want to be remembered. Does that make sense? Kind of sorta. So I'm, you know, like I'm I'm proud of myself now. I'm proud of myself now. I couldn't say that in my 20s. I can say that now. And nobody's perfect. I'm not perfect. Gwen says, I closed my Facebook account. Too much drama from groups. You're right. Rhonda says, I love a support group, but they're really hard to find. I'd rather being in person, rather being in person at the group, not the internet. Yeah. And that's hard because the small support groups are, are dying. Um, there just aren't that many anymore. The internet's so convenient. Now with COVID, I mean, they haven't had any meetings. But, you know, we still need in-person support group meetings. And I have it on our website, uh, so uh, an IC support center with how to start a support group. And if you, once COVID is under control and we can do that again, maybe next year, you know, think about starting a support group. You'll make some great friends. You know, the people you meet are awesome. The good, best part about being in a support group meeting is like you walk into a meeting thinking that there's something wrong with you, that people can see it on your face, right? And then, and you really think you're abnormal. I mean, you really think there's something fundamentally wrong with you, I mean, just something wrong. And then I remember I did my first conference and we had like 200 people in the room and I, I was the MC and I walked up to the stage and I looked out and I was like, oh, Oh my God, this is so great. And, and the context is that, God, we're normal people. We're just hurt. And it doesn't show on our face, right? It's so wonderful to have that context and to take the shame and take the blame away. And if you've got anybody in your life who is telling you that, you know, negative things, well, listen, hon. Don't let it, don't let them in. You got to have good defense mechanism, defense skills, especially on the internet. Nobody, listen, you shouldn't care what a perfect stranger says about you. You've got to have good defenses because at this point in time with life today, people will fight about anything. God forbid you have a strong opinion on something. Somebody will come after you. Samantha says, and what about when the doc says you're on too many medicines? So I see a new doc. That's what you say. I'm not going to take that. I speak up because I see specialists for every matter problem. Don't make me feel like I'm doing something wrong. Yeah, Samantha, I mean, that's absolutely right. And um, Michelle says, my urologist gave me a printout for the IC network in the first visit. One of the things that, that I like to say that I think is really, really important is that when you go to a new doctor, do not walk in and say you have IC you will fall down the rabbit hole of IC belief structures. You've got to walk in and discuss your symptoms so clearly. Say, I am here to try to understand what could be triggering this. I am not sleeping through the night. I have pain on my left side. I feel a vibration when I sit too long. I have this weird arousal sensation. Whatever, whatever the hell the symptom is, your ability to walk in and describe your symptoms is the secret to your long-term success. You cannot say, I hurt down there. That's like, where? Where? Down there. No, that's not good enough. Where? Is it, is it inside of your body or outside of your body? You'd be amazed at the number of people I talk to. They, they don't know. It's like, okay, can you touch it with your finger? What's hurting? Half of them say, yeah. I go, okay, that's on your skin. So have you looked at your skin? 
Oh gosh, no, I wouldn't. Oh, honey, you have to look at your skin. Is it a good pink color or is it red? Your ability to know your body and then describe your symptoms and describe the structures. Like for me, not to be too personal, I am very red. Not only my hair, my skin is very red down below. I mean, a hamburger red, dark red. And it's always been that way. And doctors are like, whoa, man, you're really red. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I am. Don't worry about it. It's fine. We're going to focus on this symptom. Let's focus on this symptom. And if you have a spot, you always have pain in the same location. Yeah, it's about an inch to the left of my rectum. Or it's about, or it's by my hip bone. Or it's low or it's high, but it's to the left or to the right. You need them to focus on that spot. I see doesn't have spots unless it's a weird hunter's lesion. Generally, when you can focus on a specific location, it's something wrong at that location. So a trigger point, a muscle knot, a cyst, maybe a little, you know, pus-filled cyst or something like that, or a fibroid tumor or endometriosis. I have a wonderful, dear, dear, dear friend of mine who um, they thought he had IC. It turned out he was a surgical malpractice case, patient. Um, and to make a very, very, very long story short, a doctor botched a surgery and left him with gangrene in sperm ducts, in a sperm, basically, it's, I mean, it's not quite the sperm. It was a duct down by the sperm duct. And it's like, it always hurts here. And, and when we started talking, he, I mean, he reached out to me as a patient like four years ago. And now we're really, really good friends. Um, he's like, it always hurts in this spot. And I'm like, dude, that's not your bladder. That's not your bladder, not even close to your bladder. We need to figure out what that spot is. It was gangrene in a duct in his testicle. And he had multiple surgeries. When they finally isolated that spot, it was black and it crumbled in the surgeon's hands. So anytime you have a spot, we need to look at that spot. Your goal at that appointment is help me understand what structure is located at this spot, right? And if you don't know, Google it. If you don't know your anatomy, get a book. You got to be able to talk about your vulva. <laughs> you've got, you know, you've got your, your labia majora and your labia minora, right? You got the big, the big lips and the small lips. Is your pain on the outside or the inside? Is it on one or the other? Is your, is your pain associated with pushing on something? Does it feel muscular? Is there a pulling sensation? Is a pushing sensation? Does your pain get worse when you sit down? Does it get better as you stand up or the opposite? Or, or the opposite. I still remember that Annette, uh, Annette Beeling, I think that was her last, no, not Beeling, Walker. Annette Walker co-founded the United Kingdom IC support group 25 years ago, right around the time that I started the IC network. And she couldn't sit in a wheelchair. She couldn't. She was always in a, uh, a straight, um, they could only move her lying on her back. And she'd been diagnosed with IC when clearly what she had was pudendal neuralgia. In hindsight, if you can't sit without pain, you have pudendal neuralgia. You have a, a nerve that is being compressed, usually by tight muscles. So we got to figure it out. We can't talk about therapies until you understand your anatomy. Your purpose in going to the doctor is to get an expert's eyes on your anatomy, right? 
Gwen says, I go in on the 28th for a cysto after 20 and I'm so scared. My vulvodynia is so bad. I'm afraid they will hurt me more. I have no family or friends to go with me. Are you having a cysto in the office or are you having hydro distension in the OR as an outpatient procedure? And Gwen is also mentioning another book called Pelvic Pain Explained. Um, I don't think I don't talk about that book a lot. Pelvic Pain Explained is by Stephanie Pendergrast and Elizabeth Rummer, who started the Pelvic Health and Rehabilitation Center. Um, it is an, a truly outstanding book. It is as good as any of these books. It's just much more expensive. And so that's why I don't talk about that very much. It's all about, you know, trying to be real with people's budgets. But if it, Gwen, if you got it at the library, awesome. Uh, Gwen says, my last gynecologist giggled at me when I told him I had arousal. <laughs> oh, dear goodness me. Yeah, there, honey, that inspires confidence, doesn't it? Thank you, Cindy. Cindy says, you are amazing. Thank you. Samantha says, anybody here see a good urologist in the Tampa Bay area? By the way, I was given a brand new database of chronic uh, pain, pelvic pain specialists and um, by my contacts at Harvard. And so I now have a new database, uh, a, an updated database now, uh, pelvic pain. So there are urologists, there are physical medicine specialists, there are physical therapists, pain specialists. It's a fantastic new database. And um, I'm trying to get them to put it on the Facing Pelvic Pain website, but let me see. I have it open right now. Let me open it and let me see if I can give you Samantha and Gwen. Let's, let me throw out some stuff for you, some contacts for you. All right, so hold on. So let's start with Tampa Bay, Florida. Let's see what they have in Florida. Florida is a hard state. Uh, Florida used to be one of the best states in the country for icy. Ooh, ooh, mosquito. Ooh, wait, 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 hold on. Oh, I hate mosquitoes. I kill them on site. Urgh. I get the worst reactions to mosquitoes. So anyway, I apologize for killing a mosquito. Actually, I missed it. So it's still here. Urgh. Okay, so let's go to Florida here. So in Florida, and now let me see Tampa Bay. Let me see if I can find one in Tampa Bay. So Florida now has particularly few uh, resources. Um, in Winter Garden, Florida is Avant, A-V-A-N-T, Concierge Urology. And the name of the doctor is uh, uh, per Pericotl, P-A-R-E-K-A-T-T-I-L. And he was a co-author of two chapters in this book, Facing Pelvic Pain. So you know if they're in this book, then they know their stuff. So look for, if you are close to Winter Garden, Florida, Look for Avant Concierge, uh, Encore Urology in Naples, Florida, Mount Sinai in Aventura, Florida, or Miami Beach. Um, uh, you got the Cleveland Clinic in Coral Springs and the Tomsich Health and Medical Center in West Palm Beach. And I know that the West, some of those are far away. Uh, lots of pain management doctors in Florida. If you want to call me, I'd be happy to give you some names. Couple of physiatrists for muscles and bones, Gainesville, Miami. Gastroenterologists are in Jacksonville, and lots of physical therapists. Okay, 
Now, who is this? Um, uh, Phoenix, Arizona. So Gwen, hold on. Let me look at Phoenix. So here's Arizona. Wow. Not a lot in Arizona. Um, the Arizona State Urological Institute is in Chandler, Gilbert, Maricopa, Phoenix, and Santan. The name of the doctors are Matthew Karlovsky and Gideon Richards for urology. Uh, lots of pain management doctors, one physiatrist at the Mayo Clinic, and quite a few physical therapists. All right. Anybody else in a weird state looking for a referral? Now, I don't know these doctors personally. This was a, a pelvic pain list given to me that from Harvard. Arlene is in the Tampa area. I don't think uh, any of those references said Tampa, right? I don't know. Mount Dora, is that close to Tampa? Hollywood, Florida, Fort Pierce, Florida, Gainesville, Florida, Clearwater. Sorry, I'm a Californian. I don't, I don't know my, I don't know Florida well. It's not, oh, no, 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 I take that back. There's a pain management doctor in Tampa, Jose Saria at the Aspire Pain Relief Institute. They do peripheral nerve blocks, including uh, pudendal, genitofemoral, and ilioinguinal. Inguinal sympathetic nerve blocks, and radiofrequency ablation. And then there is a Pain and Wellness Institute in, in Tampa, uh, Dr. Nininger. Um, and there's also the Acute Pain and Ketamine Clinic. Dr. Kalava treats all form of pelvic pain and performs peripheral nerve blocks, technical nerve blocks, uh, as well as IV lidocaine and IV ketamine. E Mount Dora isn't far. Uh, you can just, if you want to email me, icnetwork at mac.com or just give me a phone call and I'll try to give you more info if I can. Shell says, I forgot to say I was talking to my infectious disease doc. My three year complicated UTI started about a month after my fourth hip replacement. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Isn't that interesting? That's very, very interesting. And I can see cause and effect going both, direction, both directions, to be quite honest. The hip replacement, maybe if, you, if they had to catheterize you, they could have introduced bacteria or it, was there something pre-existing? Uh, George wants to know about New, New Jersey. Let's see what the list says about New Jersey. It's only three urologists listed for New Jersey. Uh, New Jersey Urology in Mount Laurel, Dr. William Niedrich. Uh, New Jersey Urology in Sewell, New Jersey, or in Voorhees, New Jersey, that's Dr. Butani. Uh, New Jersey Urology in Bordentown, Mount Laurel, and Willingsboro, Dr. Scott Asroff. Um, Couple of good, there are several good physiatrists for, for, for uh, doctors to look at your bones and muscles. Northern New Jersey Pain and Rehabilitation Center, Dr. Fasadi. Uh, Pelvic Rehab Medicine, uh, Melanie Howell. Rutgers, Patrick Foyer. And Pen Medicine, Jason Pan. Those are physiatrists. It will help you understand muscle and bony contributors to your pelvic pain. And lots of physical therapists. Arlene says she used to live in Petaluma. You're now stuck in Florida. Ooh, I don't know, hon. I mean, you, you can have the insects of Florida or you can have the fires of California. Although Petaluma is pretty good compared to where I'm in Santa Rosa. The whole nother story. 
All right. Shell would like a physical medicine doctor in Everett, Washington. Let me see if anybody's listed there. Uh, two urologists in Washington, both in Seattle, John Krieger and Claire Yang. They're actually NIDDK IC researchers. A couple of pain man. So you're in Everett. They've got Auburn, Bellevue, and Seattle. That's uh, pain management, uh, Federal Way, Seattle, pain management, Seattle, a hernia surgeon in Seattle, uh, physical therapist, quite a few physical therapists. Um, let me see if anyone, let me just read off some cities and you can tell me if they're close. Bainbridge Island, I don't think that's, well, that might be close. Bainbridge Island, Bellevue, Bellingham, Bremerton, Cheney, Lacey, Oak Harbor, Olympia, Port Angeles, Port Hadlock, Irondale, Polesbo, Pullman, Renton, Seattle. Spokane Valley. So shall we're any of those near you? Okay, John's asking about Wisconsin. Uh, no, they don't have any urologists listed in Wisconsin. I'm sorry to say. Oh, 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 oh. You happen to have a very, very important uh, neur neurologist IC researcher in Wisconsin at the medical, whoops, at the medical, whoops, hold on, Medical College of Wisconsin Neurosciences Division in Milwaukee. His name is Thomas Chalimsky. Lots of physical therapists. John, what's, what city are you near? Well, let me just read off some cities for you. Fort Atkinson, Greenfield, Madison, Mequon, Mequon, Milwaukee, Rice Lake, and River Falls. All right. And Shell is saying Bellevue or Seattle. It's a lot of contacts in Seattle, hon. For urology, you would go see John Krieger or Claire Yang that are both at the University of Washington. Um, uh, it says that Dr. Krieger is no longer seeing patients, but he's one of the primary researchers for the last 30 years. He would still be able to direct who on the University of Washington's faculty is best positioned to treat chronic prostatitis, chronic pelvic pain. I'll let them help you. With the... I would definitely call the University of Washington Medical Center and see if they, who works with women with pelvic pain. Um, oh, this is great. Jason, Dr. Jason Adaman who's in Seattle, is a board-certified anesthesiology fellowship trained in pain medicine and interven interventional pain management and physical medicine and rehabilitation. He is a physiatrist. He evaluates a musculoskeletal system, muscle imbalances, spasticity, and very closely interacts with and directs physical therapists. He performs nerve blocks, Botox injections, pulsed radiofrequency treatment of the pudendal nerve, uh, platelet lysate hydrodissection of the pudendal nerve, yee, platelet rich plasma of certain ligaments. Damn, I need to go see him, uh, as well as all sorts of other stuff. So, Jason Adaman is uh, would be seen, and where is he at? Looks like he has private offices in Auburn, Bellevue, and Seattle. How about California? Lori, what part What part of California? John, let me go back to Wisconsin here near Madison. Lori, you got to tell me what part of California, southern or northern? Give me a clue. In the valley or out by the coast?
So, uh, so John, um, they do have a pain, the U University of Wisconsin Pain Management Clinic in Madison. They do uh, peripheral nerve blocks, sympathetic nerve blocks, Botox muscle injections, and radiofrequency ablation. Physical therapist, SSM Health in Madison. Yeah. Okay, Michelle's asking about Nevada. Let's take it. Nevada is also a, a pretty rough state. Let's look. Where is Nevada? Ah, oh, there it is. Um, the, um, they don't have so in the Las Vegas area. Uh, Nevada Pain Care in Las Vegas, Las Vegas Pain and Spine Center. They both do a lot of nerve blocks. Not bladder therapies, they do nerve blocks. Um, the Southern Nevada Pain Center, the Desert Orthopedic Center. Uh, you've got um, Vegas Physical Therapy, does dry needling. Summerlin Pelvic Physical Therapy. Select Physical Therapy, Julie Hake. Um, <coughs> there you go. Yeah, so you got three good pelvic floor uh, groups in uh, Las Vegas. Oh, Tina Baum's gone. Oh, that's a bummer. Did I miss anybody? Gwen says, do you think I should wait till after my sister to start my physical therapy? I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Um, you're having your cystoscopy. Did you answer? Is it an in-office cysto or is it a, you're having it because of blood. He said, if I have Hunter's lesions, he can help me. I can't eat anything without a flare. Yeah. I mean, if, there, if you're dealing with a lot of pain, hun, and you got blood in your urine, I'm probably not the time. I think I would probably let somebody look in your bladder before you got real aggressive with physical therapy, I guess. But remember, I'm not a doctor. It's not my job to give you medical advice. I mean, just, oh, wait. So it's an office cysto. Well, I think having a pelvic floor assessment would be reasonable. You could certainly have that before. Um, I just don't know what the health of your muscles are. I mean, that's the whole point. I mean, are your muscles tight because your bladder screaming or is your bladder screaming because your muscles are tight? You know, the chicken versus the egg dilemma. That's what makes it hard. If it's only in the office and it's not, it's he's not considering it an urgent invasive procedure, aggressive procedure. So I think having a pelvic floor physical, physical, a pelvic floor assessment would be an interesting piece of this puzzle and good information to have, right? It's not like you're agreeing to do a lot of treatment. You're just having somebody look at your muscles. Hmm. All right, my friends. Well, listen, we've been going now almost four hours and obviously I can talk forever. I love to talk about IC, but I think it's probably time to call it. What do you say? Um, stream quality Facebook. How's the stream been? Have you had a lot of stops and starts just out of curiosity? Also, YouTube, you guys, how is the stream quality? Has it been stopping and starting? Is it clean? Fuzzy? Am I blurry or am I clear? Who knows? All right, my friends. All right. My, our phone number, 1-800-928-7496. If you find these meetings helpful, please consider supporting the IT Network. And the way that you would do that is by signing up to become a member where you get our magazine, the IC Optimist. We're starting our 19th year. Our 19th year with our magazine, you can do that for as little as $25 a year. Every little thing is, is uh, important. And so we appreciate your support. Um, please, if you can, buy stuff from us. And that's what's going to keep this going. All right. Rhonda says, YouTube's been great. 
awesome. Facebook has been pretty good. Yeah, baby. Maybe we have found our system. Now I just got to figure out the cameras because I've been looking here. I've been looking here and I've been looking here. So anyway, all right, you guys, peace. This is a new hug. Hug to everybody. Be well. Have a good week. I'm sure I'll be doing a drop-in meeting this week sometime. All right. Okay. See you later.